The 540 is brought to you by Star City Games Weekly Sale. Go to starcitygames.com slash sale, that's S-A-L-E, and this week you can save 25% off select Magic the Gathering supplies. This is your chance to protect what you collect. If you're a cube owner like me, you can outfit your cube with brand new sleeves, 25% off. Maybe you want to get a larger box to hold everything in, 25% off. Everything else along the way, deck boxers, playmats, binders, all of the above. Check it out. StarCityGames.com slash sale now through April 12th at 10.59 a.m. Protect what you collect. The 540 is also brought to you by Coalesce Apparel and Design. If you want to get the coolest magic t-shirts and hoodies and stickers, go to coalesceapparel.shop. And if you find something you like, use gift code SCG to save 10% off at checkout. That's coalesceapparel.shop. Nobody made what they wanted, so they made it themselves. What's up, everybody? Cedric Phillips here, stopping by real quick to let you know about one of Star City Games' newest podcasts, The Resleavables, hosted by yours truly, alongside my partner in crime, of course, Patrick Sullivan, where the two of us discuss magic sets, both past and present, from top to bottom. On every episode of The Resleavables, you're going to hear us talk about the facts of a set, the mechanics of a set, the cycles of a set, you know, the boring stuff, before we get into some crazy stories of when we were playing magic during the times that the set was legal. Uh, we've got a ridiculous award show where we give out awards like the Char Rumbler Award for Weirdest Card in a Set, the Oko Thief of Crowns Award for Best Card in the Set, and a whole bunch more. Before we finally decide, hey, what card won the set? And what letter grade should we give the set? It's a whole lot of fun. We're having a blast recording them. Hopefully you have the opportunity to listen to it and you enjoy it as much as we're enjoying recording them. Where can you find it? StarCityGames.com or wherever else you listen to your podcast. The Receivables, every single week here at SCG. Welcome back, everyone, to the 540. As always, I am Justin Parnell. You can find me at jparnell1 on Twitter and my beautiful, lovely co-host. I am beautiful and lovely. Thank you for noticing. My name You're is welcome. Ryan Overturf, and you can find me at Ryan Overdrive on Twitter. Speaking of you on Twitter, I specifically mentioned how beautiful and lovely you are as you posted uh, your picture with your full, full beard. Oh, yeah. I look pretty different than i did if you are familiar with my work uh in the booth as a commentator uh some 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 changes uh the, the, the beard is something i wasn't even really sure i could grow but seeing as i don't leave the house anyway it, it's the time to roll the dice you know it is the time to roll the dice yeah I've recently for i actually am on the slightly opposite end of the coin i have not been clean shaven in many many years and for a skit for commander versus i completely shaved that's dedication to the bit i respect that it, it is yeah it is dedication to the bit i pre i appreciate that not everybody appreciated that some one of my co-hosts was like all you did was shave i was like i haven't i've had a beard for a, like almost like like over 10 years i'm gonna guess so, that the naysayer was stephen green you are correct he is you are such correct. a hater he is uh, one of my favorite activities with Steven is he will start an argument about something. And ultimately, my goal is to kind of rearrange the argument so his, whatever the last thing he says is contradicting the first reason that he argued with me. <laughs> it is it is surprisingly easier than it would seem, but it does, it is sometimes time consuming. Sure, sure. Yeah. Not difficult, but you know, you gotta work, you gotta work your way in there. That's a fun little uh challenge I, I like that yeah yeah you'll be able to try it any anytime you interact with steven so <laughs> this is really open to open to anybody you know this is just a, it's just a fun game that you can play anytime you interact with steven because inevitably he'll he'll complain about something or he'll make some sort of wild accusation and then you just go from there yeah i, I bet your success rate is is actually just very high on that yeah, it is. I have a lot of practice. I have a lot of practice. You know, beyond uh, Stephen obviously being 
my compatriot on Commander Versus. We also do another podcast together. He's he's half of one of my co-hosts there, and he's also my assistant manager in my department at actual work at Star City Games. So I get a lot. I got a lot of Steven in my life. That is a lot of Steven Green. Yeah, I would say uh, probably the most Steven Green of any other person. Uh, I'm I'm hoping that I can do like n- like file file something on my tax returns about it. Uh, <laughs> I'm at you know, there's, uh, there's... I'm at close to zero daily Stephen Green these days. But when I was traveling for shows, he was the person who generally delivered my stipend. So at that point, yes. I was at above average Stephen Green. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, how many times does he complain about? complain about it when he was giving it to you he didn't so much complain about giving it to people as much as he complained about tracking people down oh yeah yeah i know something (laughs) all right so we're here this week and in a whirlwind of a last seven days the entirety of strixhaven has been completely revealed i believe we got the full preview gallery the full card gallery whatever you want to say uh either yesterday or two days ago. Either way, by the time you listen to this podcast, Strixhaven will be old hat. You're probably going to be on to the new set, whatever that is. <laughs> yeah. These uh, uh, previous but, seasons go from zero to 60 very quickly. Yeah, no kidding. So, but w- we have only recently gained access to the entirety of Strixhaven. So, here's what we're going to do. There's a lot of cards in Strixhaven, and there's going to be a lot of cards in every set, magic that comes out after this every full size set which is a bunch there's uh four more this year so we want to make sure that we can cover as many cards as we possibly can given the time constraints of the podcast because as much as i love everyone that listens i won't do a four and a half hour episode no matter what that's a lot it's just not gonna happen too much Yeah, it's too much. I would need like so, a back massage from Stephen Green if I was going to put in that kind of time. He's got strong hands. We often say he has the hands of a Russian gymnast. <laughs> uh, so it would be, it would actually be, you know, it would be worth your, it'd be worth your while to get one of those. Yeah. Uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to break up, especially for Strixhaven, and we might modify this in the future based on the kind of the construction of the set. But for Strixhaven, we're going to break it up between monocolored cards and multicolored cards. So this week, we're going to cover all of the monocolored cards that we feel like are worthy of cube discussion. And that's this is going to be for a bunch of different cubes. And then next week, we'll do the same for multicolored cards. Because obviously in Strixhaven is a very multicolor heavy set. So there are plenty of cards for us to talk about on that avenue as well. Mm Mm-hmm. We won't be talking about every card, but we will be talking about quite a lot of cards. Yes, yes. So, and then what we've done further than that is we're going to break down the cards into two categories on a per-color basis as we go. The first category is if this card is in consideration for a classic cube environment. What that means is more of your traditional cubes. And this is the one that I think most people have played and interacted with on a regular basis. Cubes that are not constrained very much by card selection, maybe in a, in a, a small amount, and generally are kind of cubes that are made up of the best cards. I'm putting that in air quotes. Right. Yeah, the general design philosophy is just cards that are very good on their own. So when we talk about a card being good in a classic cube environment, basically you see it in a pack, you think, that makes sense. You draft it, you don't. You're not necessarily looking for other things. It's just a card you're happy to play in a lot of situations. Exactly. And that doesn't mean that, you know, cards aren't going to be like some archetype specific cards, but generally from a power level perspective, these are cards that you can look at for any cube and say, this is this is something I'm considering. Yep. So number two is cards that we're going to identify as cards that could go in custom cube environments. When we say custom, we don't mean made up cards. We mean cards that are exist outside the realm of that traditional cube ideology. Maybe they are constrained by certain design philosophies of the cube owner. An example of this could be you're excluding a certain rarity. Maybe you're excluding, you know, you're only doing commons, you're doing commons and uncommons, you don't have rares. Uh, maybe you're excluding colors like a like a Grixis cube or a Teamer cube. Mm-hmm. 
uh, maybe the games are played always in multiplayer rather than a one-on-one -on -one, uh, environment. Maybe the cube is drafted always in a very specific way. So this could just be, you know, when I say something like that, I'm thinking of, you know, maybe sets that could include uh, d draft modifying or draft matters cards. Not so much in this set, but, you know, basically anything that fits in the custom is going to be one of those things and more as, you know, as cards come up that could fit elsewhere. Yeah, it could be popper, peasant, commander cube, cubes with really heavy mechanically driven designs. The sort of thing where you see a card in a pack and you start asking or at least wondering about what other cards are in the environment to support it. I've just kind of been thinking about some cards that maybe be a good example. And off the top of my head, like Wellwisher is a card where you see that in the pack. You mm. think, okay, there's going to be some stuff that obviously care about elves. It's a card that taps you gain one life for every elf you control. And then you also suspect maybe there's something going on with life gain. You see that card and you think, this isn't a card I would just put in every deck. Yeah. Side note, I think Wellwisher is terrifying in every single cube that it's in. That's, yeah, <laughs> it's agreeable. That card, so that, that card came out pretty recently when I started playing, and it is the scourge of many a casual magic table. <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah, especially once you, once you realize that, uh, at least in my youth, when I recall, when you realize that your opponent has a well-wisher, but you are also playing elves, but you did not have well-wisher, <laughs> and it counts all of the elves on the table... Tribal design it's, has come a long way. It sure has. It sure has. Not everything needs to be slivers, and thank God they're not. Right. Not even slivers are slivers. Not even, sli not even slivers are slivers anymore. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> um, okay, so so that's how we're going to do the breakdown for for Strixhaven and probably the general way we're going to do it for, for reviewing sets in the future. Not always going to be two episodes, but if the Wizards continues to design in the way they have, I would say it's a pretty it's a pretty fair assumption that we're going to be breaking it up in some sort of way. Yep. Yep, definitely. I think we probably could have squeezed Kaldheim to one, but other recent sets, that's the only one that really comes to mind. Yeah. Yeah, more very very straightforward outside of snow, which we although we did cover kind of we did talk about snow as its own own section too, so. True. Yeah, but yeah. we had to give Ice Age its due. Well, I mean, well it's due by mentioning its name. We evoked <laughs> Ice Age. We didn't necessarily give it its due. Yeah. Okay, so anything about, just kind of the overall about Strixhaven before we dive in? So Strixhaven is a set that has a pretty grabbing lore behind it, right? The, the tagline there, School of Mages, we are going to Wizard College. There's a lot of Spells Matter stuff. Um, I was a little surprised to see the breakdown in creature types. We have wizards, warlocks, shamans, a bunch of different stuff on that line, but a bunch of magic users anyway. It's really strong and loud world building, and it's the sort of thing that I think is actually a really good aesthetic if you wanted to build a cube that was inspired by Strixhaven. There's a lot to work with in this set that also plays really well with a rich history of cards. Uh, Magecraft is not all that different from Prowess, a lot of wizard matter stuff. You can go into those other tribes as well. I don't really know that there's warlock support per se, but they're, they're at least cool. They're around. Mm -hmm. And I think this is actually something that they did really well with Zendikar Rising with, with Party, where you have this mechanic that goes into all five colors. And that's a really big thing that, that gives you a ton to work with just from the jump if you wanted to build a cube around this sort of thing. Yeah. And I think that for the... The magic users, because what do they have essentially done with this set? I'm really glad you brought that up. Is they have kind of identified the magic user class in every every color, like every individual color. And while they don't have warlock, there's not a really there's not like you couldn't do like warlock tribal right now. But I believe that is the goal. I believe that's kind of where we're going to be leading. So even if you see some cards that have like the warlock creature type now. Those are good ones to kind of file away in the back of your mind for when we inevitably do get a little deeper into uh, the the tribal focus on some of those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm playing a warlock in my current D&D &D campaign, so maybe we got some of that just nice. around the corner here. I'm a big, big warlock fan. Uh, very upset 
still that they refuse to errata Dark Confidant from a wizard to a warlock, <laughs> uh, but that is a battle for another day. Yeah, I, I don't know if you're going to win that one, but... Uh, I won't, but I will be. I, re, I will remain vigilant in my loss. All right, that's fair. You, you stick to your principles. I respect that. <laughs> I, I will. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, I think that I think that the wizard school trope obviously, I mean, it pairs with magic so well. And even even if you are kind of just taking Strixhaven as a basis, like Ryan said, you will be able to pull cards that kind of match this theme from all over magic history. And I think that that would be a really cool kind of, you know, a design focus for a cube. Mm -hmm, definitely. Okay, so let's take our first break before we dive in. We got a lot to talk about today, so let's get to it. Have some extra cards laying around that you want to get rid of? Go to starcitygames.com slash sell. It has never been easier to turn your cards into cash, or if you're looking to outfit your cube or commander deck with some new favorites, get a 30% trade-in bonus when you choose store credit. No matter what your collection looks like, we have a method for you. Want to see exactly what every card you have is worth? Check out our buy list. Don't have time for that? Stick it on a box. Send it to us, and we'll make you an offer with our ship and sell program. Or if you want a more personal touch, make your way to the Star City Game Center in Roanoke, Virginia to sit down with a buyer just like the old days. With the fastest turnaround time in the industry, get an offer in under four days when you go to starcitygame.com slash sell Selling has never been easier. So before we officially start, I have to find out whether you are someone that subscribes to the notion that things always need to be in Wooburg order, or do you throw a little madness in your, in your life when you're talking about magic colors? I try to organize things in Wooburg order, but the reason that I might not always stick to that is because I will forget because I don't I don't care about Wooburg order. I care about presenting things the way that people expect you to. So mm. I will try to do it the correct way, but I might mix up the colors from time to time on accident. Okay, that's fair. I also try to stick to Wooburg order. They throw you off because the way that they print the colors of lands, so lands have that two-color border when they tap for two colors, they're not in Wooburg order. Uh, for example, off the top of my head, blue-green dual lands, it's green on the left, blue on the right. And they just kind of like did that the first time they did the border, and it wasn't based on anything, and they just keep doing it. So, yes and no. I feel like we're about to dig into something, but here we go. So, um, it actually, it actually does what you're suggesting. So, if you look at the back of a magic card, hold on, give me a second. Give me a I'm second. I'm actually here. glad you brought this up because because a lot of people probably don't know this. All right, I got a magic card. Okay, so the reason that it's like this is in a two color card. It starts with the color that precedes the other color in the shortest distance around the color pie. So if you start with, uh, let's start with white. The, 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 the colors that white would come before in a two color card would be white and blue and then white and black because white precedes those two colors on that wheel. However, when you look at red and green, red precedes white because it is the closest distance from red to white where red is first same with green so then it would be white blue white black red white green white okay i i see it i'm looking at it i there is a system that tracks i can follow that it is not going to make it easier for me to put these things in order just look at the back of a magic card and then it'll all it'll all make sense how often am i just going to have a magic card laying around I Outside of all, all, literally all the time. All the time, yeah. All right. All right, you win this one. Yeah. That's a, there's, there's your Quandrix reason. <laughs> I bet a lot of... So th that's just good. Now, if you listen to this podcast and someone else is like, I don't know why this does this, you can be like, well, actually, because we're magic players, well, we always want to well, actually, somebody. So <laughs> you're, you're welcome. Not you, but everyone listening, but also you. 
Right. Yeah. We we're, we're all you today. <laughs> we're all <laughs> okay. So let's get started with white. And we'll start with cards that we feel like go into the classic type cubes. All right, so this is a card we talked about last week. The Champs card, the Elite Spellbinder. Two and a white, three one, flying. When it enters the battlefield, you look at an opponent's hand. You can exile a non-land card from it. For as long as it's exiled, they can still play it, but it costs two more generic mana to cast. This ability does not cease when this card leaves the battlefield. So this card is just pretty good on rate. You can just play this on turn three. It's got evasion. It's got a good amount of power. It's going to disrupt your opponent's development, assuming they have some spells in hand that you can mess with one of them. Uh, and, and for that reason, there's more than enough going on here just to put this in any cube. It's also a human. It's also a cleric. Uh, this ability works with blink effects, but you don't need any of that to really take advantage of this card. Yeah. Yeah, It's this is one where I look at it, and I think it would be... It would be a, mu a much tougher argument to hear why someone was not including this in their traditional cube than why someone was. Yep, yep, I'm there. Yep. So I, I feel like, you know, we talked about this one last week, like you said, so this is, a, this is a layup, which is always nice to get us started. So I don't think that there are any other cards in white that I'm just like, this should just go in any cube that it can other than Elite Spellbinder. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm there as well. There's a number of white cards that I think are actively exciting. Um, mm -hmm. themes that I personally have worked on, stuff I'm excited for for my cubes, but there's asterisks on all of them. They're not just going to fit everywhere. Yeah, definitely. So for for some of the more custom cards, I'll jump around because I know that we probably each have favorites that we want to talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, so the first one that I want to bring up is uh, for common uncommon cubes. And, and this is Thunderous Orator. This is one in a white. It's a core wizard, 2-2 two, two, with Vigilance. It says, whenever Thunderous Orator attacks against flying until end of turn, if you control a creature with flying, the same is true for First Strike, Double Strike, Death Touch, Indestructible, Lifelink, Menace, and Trample. This is a reasonable but quite unexciting card on its own uh, if you are attacking with it by itself. The 2-2 two, two for 2 with Vigilance, that's a, a card we've seen 100 times. It's never really been good enough for Common to Common Cube. Mm-hmm. I think if you have, if, if you are considering this card and you look across the landscape of the kind of more aggressive creatures that you have in your cube and you are like, wow, a lot of these have keywords, this is, this is a pretty attractive card to consider because vig vig vigilance alongside any of these other keywords, obviously flying is a, is a huge one, uh, but even something like First strike or double strike, double strike, indestructible, lifelink. When you when you start adding those, then you start talking about cards that have have been commonly considered extremely powerful in in that environment. When you're adding any other keyword mm -hmm. to this, and that doesn't that doesn't just stop at one. If you have multiple creatures, obviously you're getting multiple keywords. Yeah, that makes sense. This card's also just like very splashable. Yes. Yeah, and I was, that's exactly the next thing I was going to say. And we've talked about limiting pips, and we have one in a white here. So I think this actually goes in a number of decks. I don't think it's going to be like exceptionally good, but if you have a larger common on common cube, or you are looking around, because I don't. That's something off the top of my head. I don't. I don't know exactly. Like, what are what is the the saturation of keywords? especially among other white cards. But mm -hmm. I think because of that, this is, a, this is a fun one to consider on its own. Yeah, I think you'll get a pretty good saturation of keywords naturally if your cube is about this sort of thing. Like if your cube is about attacking and blocking, a splashable bear with vigilance is a big deal. You can toss lifelink and first strike on that. That, that can really mm -hmm. swing games if your cube is about that sort of thing. Yeah, very much so. All right. What you got, Ryan? So I want to talk about a card. This is not a card that I like, but it's a card that jumped off the page to me, and I immediately had to yell at somebody about it. So it, it's <laughs> okay. an exciting card to see for that reason. So some people will like it. I, <laughs> it just reads really weird. So talk about Mavinda Students Advocate. 
<laughs> I don't know if there's a this is gonna this is gonna really be saying something. This might be the weirdest reading card in the entire set. It is bizarre. So we have a legendary bird advisor, two and a white for a two three with flying. Activated ability zero. You may cast target instant or sorcery card from your graveyard this turn. If that spell doesn't target a creature you control, it costs eight more to cast this way. If that spell will be put into your graveyard exiled instead, activate this ability only once each turn. If it doesn't target a creature you control, it costs eight more. Like, did, did this card play too powerful at seven? Like, I really want to know what the story is. I think that there's something with the number eight aesthetically going on this set that seems to be reading the other cards. But if you just saw this card and didn't really keep up on Strixhaven, that, that line is just so weird. I believe that this card was designed that when it was first put together, it said you may cast target instant or sorcery from a graveyard this turn that targets a creature you control. And then someone was like, well, what if I want to play this in another deck? And they're like, well, we don't want that. <laughs> we'll just put a wild, just put a huge number on it. So at least you can do it if you have a massive amount of excess mana laying around and they're just like eight. Roll a d20. And everyone, everyone agreed. Yeah. <laughs> And so th th this card, it, it's going to fit well if you like the card Feather, if you like Heroic as yeah. a mechanic. This stuff, I, I've looked into designing around that stuff as, as kind of a cube theme. It loses me a little bit because I think that the gameplay is very much two ships passing in the night. Either you snowball Heroic more than your opponent or a kill spell makes it so you have a bunch of stuff left over in your hand. I don't know. Maybe you have a design you're more excited about or maybe that stuff doesn't bother you as much, but this card's really going to fit that kind of environment. And 3 mana 2, 3 flying isn't that bad to begin with either. Yeah, yeah. On, on rate, it's, I mean, it's, it's a reasonable creature. You know, it's nothing to write home about, but I feel like if you're getting... I mean, how much does it take for this card to be beneficial? Like, one one activation of this yeah and especially one if it's like a cantripping card oh definitely yeah if, if you are in the market for uh, the card that comes to mind immediately is defiant strike because that's the white effect yep. that we keep getting mm -hmm. but if you're in the market for that sort of thing or presumably more powerful similar effects this card is going to play pretty well yeah i agree the only thing that i don't like about this card and this is ultimately going to be up to a a cube designer. I wish this wasn't a mythic rare because I think it would be more interesting at lower powered cubes because that's kind of where I feel like the card sits. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it, it, a lot of people are not willing to look the other way if if they're like, well, this is a mythic rare and I only have commons and commons in my cube, so I'm going to not include it. But I don't know. I, I would I would hope that there is a cube that is a is a lower power level that is largely based on rarity that still finds a use for this card regardless of the, the that bright orange symbol stuck on it. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of people do just cubes that are called combat cubes. And a yeah. big part of the gameplay is the cube's a lot more about giant growth than lightning bolt or doom blade. Mm -hmm. And this card's going to be pretty awesome in an environment like that. Yep, definitely, definitely. Yeah, and as, but those are also cubes where flying is no, more notable than normal. Mm-hmm. All right, so the next card that I wanted to talk about is another... I, I don't know where to place this cube. This is Maybe this is just one that I'm like, I want to keep this in, in the back of my mind for the future to see if there's, if there's other support that I, can, that I can build around this. And that's Stonebinder's Familiar. This is a 1-1 one, one for a single white. It's a spirit dog. It says, whenever one or more cards are put into exile during your turn, put a plus one, plus one counter on Stunbinder's Familiar. This ability only triggers once each turn. Now, I would like this card way more if there were less card, less words on it. <laughs> I wish it didn't say your turn, and I wish it didn't say you could only do this once a turn. Yeah, it would be really nice if you could just gas this all the way up with a Gurmag Angler. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it, well, that would still, that would still only give it one counter, because it's a, a single instance. Sure. Like, well, I, I'm saying we're gonna let that. Those are some words I would like to remove. Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Fair. Fair enough. Uh, I, I. I think that. 
there's a lot of incidental exiling where it's I, honestly I think it's the your turn part that gets me the most. Because like why can't why can't I get it like why if I sword to plowshare someone's creature why can't I get a plus one plus one counter for that? Like why not? That's that's a fair point. Yeah, I, I, anyway. I understand why you find this card charming. I, I do think that the limitations are pretty strict all put together. Yeah. yeah. It's a good dog, though. It, it is. It's a cheap spirit. Dogs. Cheap spirit. Yeah. One notable creature type and one dog creature type. Uh, I don't know. I like it, and that's exactly what it is. I find the card charming, but it's, it's, too, it's too restrictive. But I want it to be better. All right. Maybe they'll maybe they'll realize that this version did need to have all these restrictions, and in the future they'll print a less restrictive version. Yeah, that's my hope. Someday. All right. Okie dokie. So I have a card that uh, it's not the most exciting, but it is one of those cards that it's pretty clear where it goes, and it definitely has a home. Uh, it's going to be actually right next to Stonebiter's familiar on the page. We have Star Pupil. Human mm -hmm. wizard for one white mana, zero zero, enters the battlefield with plus one plus one counter on it. When it dies, you put its counter on target creature you control. So that's a new template for this ability, but we've seen this card mm -hmm. before in different colors. And it And colorless. Yes, yes, we originally saw it as Arcbound Worker. Yeah. And uh, this is just an ability that plays really well in plus one plus one counters, matters, environment. I'm sure you would see this if we got another run with the proliferate cube designed by emma handy that we had on magic online last year earlier this year who can remember within 365 I, days yep yeah, probably <laughs> but uh yeah if, if you have like a hardened scales this would enter with two counters and then when you move the counters around you compound those sorts of effects these plus one plus one counter themes tend to be focused in all of the colors of abzan just a solid one drop for that sort of thing yeah I would be off of this card if it was just you put one counter, but the fact that you put all of its counters is makes it significantly more interesting. Yeah, that is a very good point. You can pump this one up. Maybe you're playing with like Micaeus the Lunark or really any number of cards that can put counters on cards and get yeah. way more value out of this with that wording. Yeah, I, I, yeah, exactly. And there, there's a lot. Of, there's a lot of ways. There's a lot of incidental counterways. Uh, one that you are a huge fan of, Felidar Retreat, uh, <laughs> puts counters on stuff. So, if this was just one, I would just be like, I don't think ultimately this can, even if it has synergy with a lot of other things. I think the power level would just be so low that it, I, can't, I couldn't imagine it, it fitting into a cube, even if it was like around that. But the fact that it can move all of the counters, even though it only starts with one, I think that's like a that's a huge. This is the opposite of the Stonebinders familiar. Like they put the right words on this one, and they didn't on Stonebinders familiar. Sounds like somebody hates dogs. That's the only thing I can think of. Well, hates dogs or likes wizards, which I, I think is maybe more what's going on in the in the wizard school mm, set. But perhaps, perhaps we may have some evidence of that. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to do another spirit. And this is a card that I feel like is a worse version of another card that exists, but the other card that exists is pretty good. And I'm talking about Pillar Drop Rescuer. This is a spirit cleric for four and a white, two, two with flying. And when Pillar Drop Rescuer enters the battlefield, return target creature card with converted mana... Can, I literally can combine <laughs> that too with mana value three or less from your graveyard to your hand. Now, this is like a bad Custody Squire, but Custody Squire is pretty good in Popper Cubes. So I think this is worth a look for that reason. Yeah, it, it's been a while since I've maintained my own Popper Cube, but Custody Squire was one of the top white cards at the time. And also, yeah. just this category of card, there's very few Grave Diggers that don't make the cut. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, this is, this is essentially... I mean, it only gets something three or less, which is not that big of a deal. Uh, but it's also, I mean, essentially, it's Grave Digger for one more mana with flying. Yeah, that's pretty reasonable. Flying ain't bad. Yeah, it's not exciting, and it's not Custody Squire, but it's 
still it's still worth still worth talking about. Yeah, there's another. It's like a. It's from Eldritch Moon. There's a uh, black version of this kind of effect that has that wording where it's only a creature with mana value three or less, and I think yes. that that's intentional because overwhelmingly the Gravedigger effect is on four plus mana cards. Mm-hmm. So it stops you from looping them. But even if you're not looping them, they're pretty good just to have one in your deck. Yeah, it's Midnight Scavengers is the card. Yes, and it gets the rat that it melds with. Yes. And the rat's also a reasonable card. Mm-hmm. It's Graph Rats. And you make a big guard. Yep. Yeah, if you get to do that, then you're in, you're in good shape. Yeah, Graph Rats is, is actually pretty... It's just a 2-1 for 2. But obviously with the upside of making it into this gigantic chittering host and then you're in good shape. Anyway, uh, Pillow Drop Rescuer, worth considering just because of the the other class of cards. I think it's worth worse than both of the other two, but those are both very, very good. So that's as like saying like Shock is worse than Lightning Bolt. Shock's obviously still fine. Yeah. Yeah, you can you can go you can do some work with a shock. Yeah. All right. All right, so here's a card that takes some work. We have Show of Confidence. One in a mm-hmm. white, we get an instant. When you cast a spell, you copy it for each other instant and sorcery spell you have cast this turn. You can choose new targets. So it's not quite Storm. It's only your stuff. It's only instants and sorceries. But then you copy it that many times and put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature. It gains Vigilus this turn. So... I'm thinking this is likely showing up in like a peasant environment that cares about combat, but this can really change the texture of combat in one turn. I actually think this card is very powerful. Like very if you are if you if you can do this one extra time, like if you're putting a plus one plus one counter and vigilance on two separate creatures for two mana, I think I think this card's pretty awesome. Yeah, I think that it also gains some value. We haven't gotten to any of these cards yet, but the way Magecraft works, it also goes off additional times when you copy spells. So this card's going to synergize with cards that have that keyword or other cards that care about copying spells. Definitely. Yeah. Which is less in white, but there are some, which we will get to in a second. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh Next next up, before we get to the Magecraft cards, Strict Proctor. This is one and a white, a spirit cleric, one three with flying. Whenever a permanent, a permanent entering the battlefield causes an ability to a triggered ability to trigger, counter that spell unless it's controlled at pace two. This is pretty close to not letting it happen at all. Mm-hmm. And we've seen cards that are similar to this, like Hushbringer. But this gets everything. Gets them all. And there's kind of a two-way street going on here because that means if your opponent wants to use their eternal witness to get a card back, they got to pay extra. But it also means if you want to sneak that lotus field on the battlefield and not sacrifice any lands, you just Mm -hmm. choose not to pay the tax. Yep. Or, you know... Uh, Ravnica Bounce Lands. Mm-hmm. Don't have to bounce those back. Maybe an Uro Titan of Nature's Wrath or a Kruxa. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of little combinations. I think the, the deeper you dig on this card, uh, the more interesting it becomes. And it's a very... It's an unexciting but reasonable body. It's a 1-3 for 2 with flying. In irrelevant creature type spirits. So... Yeah, I, I like this card. I don't... This is a card I always have trouble, like, fitting into my cube. Mm. Because this is a card that has the ability to go late in drafts if it does not show up in the first pack or so. Like, if this is open in the third pack, I always feel like it doesn't get picked up very often. It's a bit outside of my typical wheelhouse, and I think that... A lot of times when you see this in a cube, it's probably just doing the reactive thing. It's probably trying to shut off opposing like mm. blink stuff or whatever. 
but I'll be really happy to draft a cube that is trying to proactively use strict proctor to gain value from other cards. Yeah, that's pretty. That would be pretty cool. Yeah, I'd be. I'm a fan of that. All right, we got a couple more. All right, so let's get down to some magecraft business. Talking about a card that's generated quite a bit of chatter already. Clever Lumamancer. This is a one mana zero one human wizard with magecraft. Whenever you cast or copy an instant or sorcery spell, Clever Lumamancer gets plus two plus two until end of turn. This is one of those cards that um, I think some players might read it and immediately put it in the classic camp, but make no mistake, needing to trigger Magecraft to attack for any damage at all, it means this card, it's going to attack for two more often than four and zero sometimes. That's going to happen. But if mm -hmm. you're really supporting it, this can really deal a lot of damage. Yeah, like a massive amount. Mm -hmm. So if you're just a more traditionally a classic cube environment, a lot of decks are going to place a Van Alliance over this card. But if you were really trying to play a lot of cantripping effects, a lot of combat tricks, this thing can hit really hard. And, and like you were saying earlier, you really have to... You have to think a little bit harder about how this card fits the normal because traditionally, and this goes, this is not even for like, you know, regular traditional cubes. This is for pretty much every cube across the board. White has the lowest, white and green have the lowest number of instants and sorceries in those colors mm -hmm. compared to the other three. So it's not as much of a gimme, but the, the payoff is pretty big in my opinion. Yes, this can definitely get out of hand. We're kind of getting more one mana cares about instants and sorceries to deal extra damage stuff over time. It's getting a little bit more spread across multiple colors, but just cheap stuff that gets that pays off your cantrips, that, that's a big deal. Just costing one mana versus an effect that is similar to cost two mana, which we'll be getting into in a second, that, that yeah. sort of thing does matter. Definitely. So speaking of which, and this is the last white card we have queued up, Leonin Light Scribe. This is the other Magecraft, the other notable Magecraft card for white. One and a white. It's a 2-2 two, two Cat Cleric. And the only text it has is Magecraft, whenever you cast or copy an instant or sorcery spell, creatures you control get plus one, plus one until end of turn. I love this card. This is the, I love this card too. This is my, this is my favorite white card. I like Clever Lumamancer, but ultimately I think this the the floor for this card is higher than the Lumamancer, so this will make it into more of my cubes. Yeah, hey, just always being a grizzly bear as opposed to having a zero power stat line, that matters. It matters in the average game, it matters because white has fewer instants and sorceries, and it's the sort of thing that catches up to you when you mulligan as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, this also, I, the upside for this is ultimately higher. You can do more damage individually with the Clever Lumamancer, but if you are, if you have two or three other creatures out, uh, adding a, a, a giant growth or better across your entire board for a single spell is, is pretty massive. And it's also the case that, sure, white, gets fewer cantrips, but white does have a pretty good volume of instants and sorceries that make tokens. Yes. So you can develop your board while you're also anthemming your existing board. I mean, the Onan Light Scribe plus Lingering Souls is disgusting. <laughs> yeah, it is. I don't feel like with this card, like with the difference between Lumamancer and the Light Scribe is I actually do feel like I really need to be into cantripping with the Lumamancer. I don't feel like that's the case with the Light Scribe. Mm -hmm. I feel like I can just kind of coincidentally cast instants and sorceries. And if there's if, if I have instants, then I can save them to be to make them tricks. But even if I just have sorceries that I'm just going to be casting normally, exactly like you said, something like Lingering Souls or any other token makers. Th those are those are cards that are just giving your team a glorious anthem for the turn for at no additional cost. 
and in, in the cube environment, you're not you're not going to be casting inconsequential spells. Like, there's nothing that you're going to be, like, adding to your deck because you want to trigger Magecraft. It's going to be the other way around. You're going to have a, have a card that gets a benefit from those instants and sorceries, but you're not necessarily... Ha you don't have to plan around it with, with the Light Scribe as much as you do the Lumimancer. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, it, there's just so many factors that make what you just said true. It's often going to be the case in really in any limited environment, also in cube, where patience with removal spells and pointing them at the right thing mm -hmm. is really a big deal. Yeah. With the Lumamancer, that, that's going to mean hanging back or firing off your removal spell before you necessarily want to. With the Light Scribe, I mean, even just being able to attack as a 2-2 with all your mana up, your opponent has to think twice about blocking there. You just get to play your spells much more deliberately. Definitely. Yep. That's a great way to put it. I think that's everything in white, which is might be the most. White white got pretty good as far as as far as options across a lot of different cubes. Yeah, a lot of nice white options. Um we will be getting to a couple more white cards later, but uh, as part of a package. So uh, keep keep that in mind if there's some white cards you maybe are wondering about to this point. Yeah, we'll get to them. We'll get to them. Okay. Uh Blue is up next. What do we have to start with? So blue, this is another list where we have one classically powerful card, and I am I'm pretty bullish on this card. It mm -hmm. uh, we'll see how it actually plays out, but we have multiple choice. It's a sorcery for blue and X. If X is one, you scry one, then draw a card. If X is two, you may choose a player. They return a creature they control to their owner to its owner's hand. If X is 3, you create a 4-4 four, four blue and red elemental creature token. And if X is 4, you do all of it. So you get a 4-4 four, four for 5 mana. You may choose a player and have them bounce a creature. So either your opponent has some stuff you don't care about being bounced. Maybe you bounce your own thing. Maybe you skip this one. That's fine too. And then you also scry one and then draw a card. So you have a 1 in... Th for, for 2 mana, scry one, draw a card. Not very powerful, certainly at sorcery speed. But that's a fail rate, and it'll help you find your lands, which is presumably why you're casting this card early, is because you don't have lands. If X is 2, that bounce spell is inefficient, but it's fine. 4 mana, 4-4. Four, four. Hey, if you need a blocker, you can do a lot worse than that. But then when you're actually casting the card for 5 mana, I think that the combination of those, card, those abilities is quite powerful. Yeah. And that's really... I mean, with anything that is modular, and I'm putting kind of air quotes around modular for this card... I'm completely unexcited by anything except for X equals four, but I know from experience that is not an appropriate way to evaluate cards like this. Mm -hmm. uh, when it's X equals four, it's awesome. It's absolutely worth five mana in the vast majority of situations to put to put a token, scry draw a card, bounce a thing, uh, and a sizable token at that. It's it's going to be great regularly, but there are going to be situations where you're going to do it for less and it's never going to be good it's never going to be worth the price of admission but that's not the point when you have an option mm -hmm. yeah that that's exactly it the, this card just lets you do something early and that that's a, a spot where a lot of cube decks crumble is maybe your mana curve didn't work out the way you wanted it to like the weakest cube decks I tend to see, or the worst performing cube decks, have the issue where they just draw too many of their expensive spells early. And the more of your expensive spells that can do something in the early game, uh, Walking Ballista is a very good example of this sort of thing. That's an awesome card to have in your deck if you can generate a lot of mana. And it's a super reasonable thing to do on turn two as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, Walking Ballista is awesome. Yeah. But I, I, so the thing that I like about this card, I'm glad you, I'm glad you brought up the, the, like the, you know, the draft portion is this is something I feel like there are always cards that are either less impactful than their draft position or more impactful than their draft position. And I feel like multiple choice is a card that's always going to be more impactful than its draft position because it's not going to go early because it's really easy to see the lack of upside for this card if you're casting it for anything less than four. Mm hmm. And I think when you're doing that, when you are casting it for four, it's going to overperform relative to where you drafted it in pretty much every cube. The fact that you this is incredibly easy, easy to splash, like wildly easy to splash, one, one single blue mana. Um, 
and that it's for for other cards that you're you could potentially be comparing this to it's it's always going to look worse because you're not able to evaluate it in a pack like when you're drafting and saying well i'm always going to be able to do this for x equals four and i think that plays to the benefit of the card as a drafter because you'll be able to get it later than you would be able to relative to its power yeah, it's the kind of thing that you will very often wheel and almost always play. Yes. Yeah, it's going to be a high rate of making your deck. That's something when I'm when I'm drafted, I uh I guess by the time this comes out, the last the last few days uh when I was streaming, I I commonly talk about cards that I am picking and the the rate of when they are going to appear in my deck. And this is a card that has a really high rate of appearing in your deck no matter how it kind of pans out. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have a few other cards. That's the only card that we feel like is going to kind of fit into like a lot of traditional, the classic, the classic cubes, what we're calling them. Uh, but there's a lot that are going to be in more of the custom environments. So one of those is Waterfall Aerialist. And this is a common, and I really feel like this is going to be largely in common only cubes, but I think it's pretty powerful there. Three and a blue. A Jin Wizard, a 3-1 with flying, and it has Ward 2. And Ward is essentially the Frost Giant or Frost Titan ability. So whenever this creature becomes a target of a spell or an ability an opponent controls, counter it unless that player pays whatever it is. In this case, it's two generic mana. Uh, this is a ward, I think, is very powerful. I don't I think. It's pretty close to hexproof if it's anything more than one. And a 3 1 flyer with hexproof is a card that I would slam into any uh, commons only cube. And this is close enough for that to me that I would be very, very interested in playing this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a 4 mana 3 1 hex flying hexproof would be more likely to be too powerful than not powerful enough. Yes, exactly. The ward is not so, quite that, but uh, the comparison to Hexproof is apt because in opponent controls is a very important phrase in that tax. Mm -hmm. Yep, definitely. Yeah, so I'm a big fan of this card, and it's if you have other flyers, it's obviously easy to kill, but uh, a 3-1 is a huge clock for really for any format. You're, as long as you're starting with 20 life, I think 3-1 flyer is a pretty big clock. Mm -hmm, definitely so I'm a, big, I'm a big fan of this one for lower powered cubes yeah the, the three power mark that, that is an important line to cross that's a lot of damage yep all right what you got i have symmetry say symmetry sage mm -hmm. it is a one blue mana a zero two with flyings a human wizard so we have another card that uh, doesn't give you any damage on its own you really like these zero power creatures, Ryan. I do. I I, uh, I like Enclave Cryptologist a lot, though uh, <laughs> that one is a little less of this nature. But th this is kind of another aggressive creature. It has Magecraft. When you cast or copy an instant or sorcery spell, target creature you control has base power two until end of turn. So if you're casting any instant or sorcery, this becomes a two two flyer, and that's going to come up when you're playing other Magecraft or power or prowess creatures. If your cube is about that sort of thing, a lot of creatures that get pumped when you cast instants and sorceries or non-creature spells have less than two base power. So casting two spells when you control this on its own, yeah, that's not great. Casting multiple spells when you control this and, say, a clever Lumamancer, then this card is also giving you four damage. So it really snowballs well with those things. It plays into what we talked about last week on the cube wish list, it is a blue creature that is aggressive, which yep. makes for more engaging gameplay. So the card this reminds me the most of, and this is going to sound super weird, this reminds me the most of Signal Pest. Okay, I see it. Yeah, that makes sense. Be because this is a card that it's, it's this is virtually never going to die in combat. Because if it would, you're just not going to send it. But it can sit there it can always it can always chip away with its own damage if it's the only thing that you have and if you're able to do multiple you know the more creatures and the more spells that you have being able to spread that out because like you said surprising amount of creatures have less than two power and even adding like one 
after you after you do itself to make it a two two it's not it's not relevant so I like this card I'm not in love with it but I I also think that this card is gonna be is gonna play better than I'm envisioning in my head. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a reason that I'm not putting it in the classic pile. I think that you do have to pay a lot of mind to making sure that your prowess, your magecraft-style deck, has a good split of creatures, innocents, and sorceries. But just yeah. kind of like we talked about with Clever Lumamancer, one mana creatures, that is just a very important section of your mana curve to fill out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you want to get those down before you start casting the instants and sorceries generally. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. All right, uh, let's go with a card that is going to be a very specific environment, Tempted by the Orique. This card would be a high pick for me in a multi in a multicolored, a multiplayered cube. It'd actually be a very low pick in a multicolored cube because it's got three blue pips. <laughs> but in a multiplayered cube, I think this card is awesome. And it's going to be awesome in Commander too. One blue, 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 sorcery. For each opponent, gain control up to one target creature or planeswalker that player controls with a mana value three or less. Everyone is going to have one of those, and if you were playing a four-player game, you are, for four mana, gaining control of three things. That's an absolutely nuts rate. I don't care if they're, if they're three mana value or less. That is, a, that is a super crazy rate. It doesn't have a aura that it's attaching to that you can kill to get it back. It is literally just a sorcery. Let me get those things, and uh, I think this card is completely awesome. I would be 100% with you if it named Artifact. You're probably still getting your mana's worth as templated, but I really just want to steal rocks. Yeah. This card would be, this card would be crazy good if you could, if you could get Artifacts, <laughs> oh, too. Yeah. It would be an immediate constructed commander staple. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, instantly. If you could, if you could get Artifacts, this would be one of the best commander cards in the entire set. Mm -hmm. and it's still pretty good. Uh, as it stands, I think it's still pretty good. This is, I would slap this into any multiplayer cube, period. Inst in, this, is a, this is an instant stable for that. Yeah, and really the, the big reason why you wouldn't put a control magic effect in your cube is because it's kind of a feel-bad thing. But these designs that only grab smaller things, the, mm -hmm. the game plays a lot better on that sort of thing. Yeah. Okay, what's, uh, what we got next? Let's jump over to Frost Trickster. Let's talk about another low-power environment card. Okay. Most charming to me as somebody who once maintained a popper cube, because I was not that into Frost Links, but here we have two and a blue, two, two, Flyer, a bird wizard. That when it enters the battlefield, you tap a creature and opponent controls, and it does not untap during his controller's next on tap step. So Windrake sure has fallen from grace, but yeah, I am here for Windrake <laughs> with upside. I'm here for Fro Frostlinks with upside. Man, I actually think in Popper Cubes, Frostlinks is actually pretty reasonable, and this card is so much better than Frostlinks, it's actually hilarious. I was pretty surprised that they just gave Frostlinks flying. Yeah, and they made it a... They, the trade was an elemental, and they turned it into a wizard, which... I think I think it's an upgrade. It's often an upgrade. Yeah. Uh I, I this card is this card is like a this this is I mean this is literally a slam dunk in any popper or peasant cube. Mm -hmm. yep. Just easily. It's good for punching your creatures on the ground through because you get to ice a creature and then it's just an evasive body that you're pretty happy playing paying three four to begin with. You can play this on an empty board and that's fine. Yeah. I I think this card is like obnoxiously good for those environments like i don't i i thought i actually think that frost frost links was fine you are a frost links hater <laughs> and that's okay but i think that frost links was fine frost trickster uh and i guess it needed flying sure here we here we are i would describe myself as a frost links detractor not an outright <laughs> hater okay all right we have to we have to break down Ryan's level of disdain for things. I just want to be properly represented in the conversation. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Next up, we have Mentor's Guidance. Now, this theoretically should be one that you like, Ryan, because this is a tribal-focused card. 
And this would specifically go into a tribal focus cube, but if, you, if you're in a tribal focus cube, I actually think this card's pretty powerful. Uh, two and a blue, sorcery. As you, when you cast this spell, copy it if you control a planeswalker, cleric, druid, shaman, warlock, or wizard. And it simply says, scry one, then draw a card. So there are things I like about this card. I think that this has kind of the opposite thing with Frost Links and Frost Trickter. I think the problem is that I'm spoiled by Of One Mind. Well, I mean, Of One Mind is incredible, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're definitely spoiled by that card, because that's just divination for a blue. Yeah, but, like, uh, the, the thing is, when you don't fit the stipulation, you can still cast divination. This card is better than divination when you fit the condition, but it's pretty embarrassing to cast when you don't, which is a little tough sure. space for me. Which is why I'm suggesting that you are putting this into a cube where you are supporting tribal as a focus. I would like this card at two mana quite a lot. This card would be very powerful at two You mana. got me, Justin. I'm not, I like I'm not powerful disagreeing. cards. You found me I'm, out. <laughs> oh, God. I'm not disagreeing. I don't think it would be too powerful because it's pretty bad if you're just casting it to scry one and draw a card. It's about two mana and a... It's about it's about two mana and a a different speed of spell. Too bad, but yeah. look, I, I think I like if, if you can always card. make this trigger. If you can make this trigger, I don't want to I don't want to force you. I don't want to force you to like anything you don't like. I just thought you like your tribal stuff. You like your wizards and warlocks. You're talking about that, <laughs> and now you've turned on them instantly. All right, so I, I appreciate the sentiment. Thank you for trying to appeal to my sensibilities, Justin. Right, what I want to say about to this do. card, here's a little tinfoil hat for you. Okay. This card makes me suspicious that the D&D set might not mm. do exactly party. This could be teasing a party that is comprised of cleric, druid, shaman, warlock, or wizard. This could be teasing that sort of mechanic. I think that you could be right, and I think if you are right, that is a terrible decision. <laughs> I mean, I want to see more party a lot. Also, if we're going to do two mechanics that are like this, and we're just not even talking about bards, what are we doing? But yeah, this I card know. does jump out to me for that reason. Yeah, seems like a really weird collection of creature types planted on a single card. Yes. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Uh, we got one more blue one? Yeah, we got one more blue. Uh, please just tell me what it is. Archmage Emeritus. Oh, yes. Oh, this is a nice one. This card is we'll almost there for, uh, for a classic cube. It is a four mana yeah. human wizard, two generic, two blue, two two, magecraft. When you cast or copy an insta or sorcery spell, draw a card. It's, uh... The exact same body, I guess. Talrand is a merfolk, right? I'm pretty sure Talrand's a merfolk that uh, makes two two flying drakes when you cast innocent or sorcery. So, kind of a similar template there, where these are cards that they could just show up in your cube. A lot of what blue is up to is good instants and sorceries, but it's more likely you're into this sort of thing if you are trying to make things more about creatures and ground your cube that way. Do you remember last week when I was saying I just want them to print cards for cube? I don't care if it ruins a constructed format. Just make this cost one blue blue and just give it to me for cube. I don't care if it ruins constructed. I'll sacrifice this format. That card would be absurd in cube. Yeah, but I also don't think that this one is quite good enough. Yeah, yeah, it's like a, it's like a three and a half mana effect. Yeah. Yeah, which I completely agree with. I agree that card would be that would be nuts, but it's it's very fragile, you know, still two two. Uh, but I for for four mana, I'm like not I'm not interested in this in most cases, in traditional cubes anyway. Yeah. And at three mana, I would snap it. It's the sort of thing where there's a lot of cards of this nature, right? Four mana permanent that promises card advantage later more than it pays you off for casting it now. Yeah, where. You really wish you were impacting the battlefield more. Yeah, uh, it's to me, especially for blue. That's when I'm starting to cast my big, 
Look, it's when I'm starting to cast Cryptic Command. So I want to play this before I play Cryptic Command. Yeah, so That's you really say what it comes down to. you can draw two cards. Exactly. Or I can just not draw a card if I need to bounce something and counter something and draw a card so I don't feel like I'm missing out. Build your own Mystic Confluence. Exactly. You told me last week I should ask for more, and that's what I'm asking for. Okay. Yeah, One that was blue. that was really more for Boros players than blue players. <laughs> not, but not blue draw yeah, cards. You are listening at least. <laughs> Look, that's what I got. All right, let's move on to the best color in Magic. Black. In case you were, you sounded like uh, your little, silence indicated you were. I was a little confused because I thought we were talking about the best color in Magic, but. Uh... Huh. Well. Why don't we list off these uh, black classic cards and you tell me what you think. All right. Cards that we feel like can fit into every cube. Uh, black made out like a bandit in this set. There's some nice ones. There are some nice ones. Uh, I would like to start with what mm, is probably my favorite card in the set. And that's going to be one Sedgemore Witch. Two and a black... It's a human warlock, a 3-2 with menace. It has ward, as we talked about previously, but this is three life rather than mana. So you can target it, but you take three. So this is the Terror of the Peaks type ward. And then it has Magecraft. Whenever you cast or copy an instant or sorcery spell, make a 1-1 one, one black and green pest creature token. When this creature dies, you gain one life. I love Young Pyromancer. I'm going to play Young Pyromancer in every single color I possibly can, and this card is awesome. It's mm, about the same as Young Pyromancer, all things considered. Obviously, it only costs, it costs three mana instead of two, but Menace and Ward on top of that is... Give me a thumbs up. I mean, I, and the tokens are slightly better. Ideally, you would have some two-mana creature for this effect, but you are getting a lot for that third mana. Some evasion, attacks on opponent spells, like... If you're playing a Spells Matter deck that's playing cheap creatures, three life is a real cost. You gotta figure your deck is pressuring your opponent's life total. Well, and the fact that this card has Menace, the thing about Pyromancer and other cards like that, you are generally not gonna, like, tangle with them in combat. This is not necessarily the case with this card. It's also black. So, like red, you're gonna have a plethora of, of well-costed removal. Young Pyromancer is going to get colded by literally any other creature. Like, period. If your opponent has a creature that you can't get rid of, you're not going to attack with Pyromancer. Mm -hmm. If your opponent has one creature and you have a Sedgemore Witch, you hit them for three, and then they have to pay another three life for you to kill it. And then and also, just the sorts of decks this goes into, we're talking about a black deck that probably has a pretty high volume of instants and sorceries. It's likely going to be Demir, Rakdos, or just the full Grixis. Mm -hmm. And what that means is you probably have some pretty good kill spells or bounce spells or just to spread of both of those things. And if yeah. you're a Rakdos deck, like this also just plays great in the sacrifice. Yes. You're making tokens. You can do stuff with those. You just have some instances of sorceries that can either be threatened effects for your sacrifice outlets or stuff that um, is removing blockers. All that sorts of thing fits into that kind of deck. And then making tokens while you go is really powerful. Yeah, this is my this is my slam dunk pick for if you have a cube and this fits the qualifications, put it in the cube. Yeah, this this card is just awesome. Yep. There's more awesome black cards though. There are. Here's a card that I am very excited about for two birds. This one looks awesome for the two player cube. Baleful Mastery. Three and a black, you have an instant. This is part of a cycle that lets you pay a reduced cost with some drawback. So you can cast this spell for one and a black instead of three and a black. And if you do that, an opponent draws a card. The text is exile target creature or planeswalker. So we've seen a lot of four mana exile a creature or planeswalker, various upsides. Typically, you'd see something like Vraska's Contempt where you gain some life. You get something extra because you're paying so much mana for this effect. This card instead can play for cheaper, and a lot of cubes are really about presence on the battlefield, certainly when we're talking about the really high power environments. It's going to be a lot of games where it's well worth it to get your opponent a card to clear off 
maybe it's a sticky threat. Maybe on turn two, you would rather not be facing down Scrap Heap Scrounger. Maybe on turn four, it's really to your benefit to exile their Jace the Mind Sculptor and do something else on that turn. There's a lot of reasons why you would pay the discounted cost, and giving your opponent a card for that sort of thing in a high power environment is well worth it. And then if you just get into the late game and you have four mana, a lot of the cards that do this just cost four mana anyway. Yeah, yeah. If you have the mana, you can do it for four. To me, I, I compare this to Path to Exile. There's not a lot of situations that I'm going to cast Path if my opponent plays a creature on turn two. Mm -hmm. Like, it has to be, it has to be like, I'm going to lose to this creature. I have a lot less apprehension to do that if they're just drawing a card. And I think that's a, that's a really big deal to be able to be able to play this early. I, I, I don't think that the drawback is that bad for what, for the effect that you're getting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I imagine that you are paying for a lot of the time, but I think that uh, I am willing to pay two for this card more than the average player. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Yeah. If, if it is if it is going to disrupt my curve to play pay four, I will just happily pay two and just go about my day mm -hmm. with exiling it and playing something else. I, I don't know. I kind of think it's going to be about split fifty fifty. Of, I guess it kind of depends on on how how important curving out is for you, right? But especially for like an aggressive deck, I will give you a card so much faster than just about anything else, because you might not get a chance to cast that card. Yeah, especially if we are getting into a territory where we actually have a black X spells matter deck. Yeah, you know, if you control the card we were just talking about, if you control Sedgemore Witch, then getting that token, well, that's some value right there. That's value that's on the battlefield. So giving your opponent a card matters less in that kind of situation. Yeah, definitely. And there's a bunch of other cards, obviously, in this set and just across Magic, especially now that you you are, are getting more of the same type of effect. I, I don't know. I don't know if we had, I feel like we had talked about this on a, a previous episode, but when you get, when you get a redundant effect that often makes the other effects better. Yes. So the more spell slinging type stuff that you have means, uh, the more options you have to bring to the forefront of cards that may not have been as viable before. Absolutely. Okay. So, uh, I'm going to go with, and this is still classic. I feel like this can go in any cube. Callus uh, Blood Mage. Two and a black. It's a 2-1 Vampire Warlock. When Callus Blood Mage enters the battlefield, choose one. Create a 1-1 one, one black and green pest token with when this dies, you gain a life. Or you draw a card and lose one life. Or exile target player's graveyard. I think if you see this card and you don't think this card is made for cube. You've never cube drafted in your entire life. And I don't know why you're listening to this podcast. <laughs> so that they can learn, Justin, so that we can assimilate them. I think this is, this is probably... Is my, I like Sedge, Sedge more Witch better, but I also think this is like a super duper layup for pretty much any cube. All right. We've talked about like Phyrexian Rager and it's, you know... <laughs> Uh, another card that Ryan absolutely loathes, uh, but hey, the, the I, flexibility. I own an Apocalypse foil Phyrexian Rager. Okay, that that's a home okay. run in the Popper Cube. I was gonna bring out Phyrex Stranger too because I'm not making a value statement, but look at that card next to Callus Blood Mage, and uh, with the knowledge that Phyrexian Rager is currently in the Magic Online Vintage Cube. Well, not anymore. It's not. <laughs> Uh, yeah, this card, I mean, this, you want to talk about, uh, modal stuff and a card being able to wear a lot of different hats? This is a, this is an easy one. Yeah, this card's great. Yeah. It's worth, I think, I think it's least impactful side is the Friction Rager side, so. Yeah, I mean, two bodies is really nice. A lot of reasons why you might want that. We've talked about sacrifice decks. If you're into Skull Clamp, this is also a 2-1, yeah. so it's clampable. So you get a lot of value with that sort of thing. Definitely. Exile and graveyard. You're gonna do the, gonna do the graveyard one the least, but when you do it, it's gonna be good. Yeah, you're you're it's doing that because that works. it's just a huge amount of value for you. Exactly. All right. Any other slam dunks? All right. We have we have one more. 
mm. in, the, in the slam dunk, in the classic category. The Planeswalker, which is, uh, <laughs> you're going to see a lot of Planeswalkers in kind of this if you continue to listen to us previewing future sets. But for four black black, we have Professor Onyx. It's actually a Liliana Planeswalker, which I didn't realize at first. So write yep. that down. It has five loyalty. It has a static ability. This is something we're seeing on more Planeswalkers these days. So it has Magecraft. When you cast or copy an instant or sorcery spell, each opponent loses two life and you gain two life. And it has two is a lot. It is in both directions. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a, a real lot number. of life. That's a super real number. Yeah, we're starting at five plus one loyalty. You lose a life. Look at the top three cards of your library. Put one into your hand, the rest into your graveyard. Minus three loyalty. Each opponent sacrifices a creature with the greatest power among creatures that player controls. So it's an edict for big things. And for minus eight loyalty, each opponent may discard a card. If they don't, they lose three life. Repeat this process six more times. I mean, this is a pretty robust amount of loyalty. If you untap, you activate that plus one, you're looking for instance in sorceries. Maybe with this mill ability, you're dumping some stuff with flashback. A big thing that planeswalkers do for controlling strategies is they offer you a life total buffer. And that Magecraft ability, not, not only is it just kind of killing your opponent, you know, you're draining them for two every time, but that extra yeah, life, if you can start casting spells, that this is just huge. Yeah, yeah, I think this card is awesome. It's like, it's, it's the knobs are turned just enough to make this powerful without being oppressive. Yes. Sweet spot. Yeah, I, I, I love this card also. Five loyalty is also a massive, massive amount. Mm-hmm. And six mana is a crowded spot, I get that. And it, it's likely if you're including this over some of the other six mana cards, it's because this card's a little thematic with what you're up to, but on power level, it's just there to show up. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, like, all, all of these, all of the abilities on this card are great. I'm not even counting the minus eight, because you'll, obviously, you're going to win the game if you, if you activate that. Right. But, uh, yeah, but the, the fact that, like, I really cannot express to the listeners how critical that Magecraft is going to be. If you're playing this in like a, a blue-black control deck, uh, this there you probably won't need many other win conditions mm -hmm. if you're able to control the board beyond this. Uh, even, the, even the plus one being able to essentially cast anticipate at the cost of one life, except they go into their they they go into your graveyard instead of the bottom of your library is massive. It just does all of all of the words that are all, that I want to be on this card are present. Yeah, and that ability it costs one life, but that's not to make that ability worse. It's because the mage craft to gain two life <laughs> every time is really so much. good. Yeah, honestly, that could just say you lose two life, and I would feel the same about this card. Like it wouldn't make it any worse. If you lost two life to do that, uh, but it's just better that you don't. Yeah, and I I kind of expect this one to show up in the in the vintage cube just because it it's kind of tendrils of agony on the battlefield. Um, it's not gonna be at its best there, but I mean a version of this card that costs five would be absurd if we're talking about supporting storm, and at six yeah, it it's still playable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it would be absurd. I can't imagine you'd have to really ratchet down the loyalty to to make this cost. It would ha have to come into play with like three loyalty, yeah, to cost five. Okay, so those are all the cards we feel like are in the classic environment, and they're all. I, I legitimately think all of those cards are awesome. Like black, like 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 I said, black is really punching above its weight for this set. Isn't its weight the best color in Magic? Yeah, but even still, but like <laughs> we're, we named, well. Sure. If the, if it's the best color, we for classic we named one white card, one blue card. So even if we named two black, that would still qualify. That's a very good point. Yeah, we just named four. Four is a lot. Okay, so for the custom, uh, a card that I that I quite like, and I I really really want this card to be good because I think it's really powerful is Tenured Ink Caster, four and a black, Vampire Warlock two two. When Tenured Ink Caster enters the battlefield, put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature, which could include itself. So at worst, you're getting a three, three for five. And then it also says whenever a creature you control with a plus one, plus one counter on it attacks, each opponent loses one life 
and you gain one life. Uh, that is similar to... Oh my gosh, I'm blanking on the name of the card. It's from Fate Reforged. Brutal Horde Chief? The, the Mythic Rare? Yes. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. But this is an uncommon, which is great because this is uh, where I would like to have my plus one, plus one counter themes because I generally think that that's kind of the power level where it, it can be very powerful uh, and not get overshadowed by other strategies. Mm -hmm. And in that, in that type of environment, you, this, can, this can be like a finisher. If you have, I mean, if you attack with like three creatures with plus one, plus one counters on them, that's a, I mean, you're, you're almost casting Soul Feast for free, and which is massive. There's environments where you just don't have to work very hard for that sort of thing to be common. There's yeah, not at all. quite a lot of creatures at this point that just enter the battlefield with plus one, plus one counters. If you're doing it the hard way, sure. If you have to actually manually put the counters on, but if you're getting up to Arcbound Worker style stuff, you could play this on turn five and you've just curved out with only creatures that already had counters to that point. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it honestly does not take much effort. It, it takes a, a cursory look around to make sure that you, you, you change a couple of things around to make sure you have a few more than you might have had previously. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think this card's awesome. I think it can be awesome in higher, higher rarity cubes too. But then five mana starts to become a lot more. Yeah, presumably your higher rarity, lower power. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Where you have access to rares, which I think is great, but uh, if you, you you would need to have a lower power level in general to have this be a an impact card. And if it's not an impact card, you're probably not including it. Right. All right. What's what's next? All right. Got one more custom card for black. So. Black a heavy hitter at the classic power level in this set. A little lighter in custom cards, but this one is really sweet. We have Orik Lore Mage. Four mana, three, three, human warlock. Two generic, two black. You can tap it to search your library for a card. Put that card in your graveyard, then shuffle. If that card's an instant or a sorcery. You put a plus one, plus one counter on Orik Lore Mage. This card is definitely going into my spooky cube. Because it's a cube that A, cares about humans, B, cares about cards in the graveyard, C, is not going to touch anything as powerful as Entomb. Yeah, so for the trifecta. Yeah, exactly. We're, we're talking about playing out of the graveyard, generating some card advantage, having some investment where, you know, the gameplay is largely about actually untapping with the creature to start gaining advantage, and you want games to kind of snowball in that way. This card is just awesome. If you're looking up for stuff with flashback, then you get to both gas this up a little. You get plus one, plus one counters. Maybe you go and, quote unquote, two drop your spider spawning right to your graveyard or something like a firebolt, and you can cast that out of your graveyard right away. And this thing also, 3-3 three, three into 4-4, four, four, that's actually a pretty real body in this kind of environment as well. Yeah. Oh, that's for sure. And I'm kind of looking at this card. It's are you able to cast the card that you're putting or interact with the card you're putting in your graveyard this turn? If the answer is yes, then you bend it and you make this grow. And if not, then you have a sizable creature after you activate it one time. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I, like, I like this card. I'm glad it's a 3-3. Three, three. I think if it was a 2-2, two, two, it would actually be, like, significantly worse. I think, I think that's a very, very big a very very big deal for this card yeah you don't even uh, have to go too far better. like just in cards i was naming to play it with if this creature dies to firebolt it's significantly worse than the environments that <laughs> want it yeah exactly yeah yeah being able to have three toughness before you can untap with it to two is just huge okay well that's uh that's white and blue and black and we've spent an hour on those plus so we still got more to go but let's go ahead and take this ad break and we will come back and finish it up what's up gamers taking a quick break from the pod here to let you know about the upcoming magic set strixhaven school of mages strixhaven is the most elite university in the multiverse that means more elite than talarian academy that means more elite than wizard school from homelands it's got them all beat 
It features five colleges which battle it out with their own takes on magic. And from what we know about the set, that means we're going to see heavy representation of all five enemy color pairs. And for my money, that means blue-red cards. Obviously, it means wizards. There's more than enough to sell me already just there. And you can pre-order your Strixhaven Seal products now. Go to StarCityGames.com slash previews to do so. Strixhaven School of Mages. Magic goes to college. Right, Ryan, we've gone through three, three colors. Some good, some mediocre, not a whole lot of bad. I think so far Strixhaven's offered quite a bit. Yeah. We have red up next. Red up next. Red so often disappoints, but never me. I love red. <laughs> well, uh, what do you... Actually, I'll, I'll start off with this one. I'll start off with this one. For the classic... Uh, a card I'm quite fond of in this set just in general, I think, is a super sweet card. This is Conspiracy Theorist. One a red, two two, Human Shaman. Whenever Conspiracy Theorist attacks, you may pay one and discard a card if you do draw a card. Okay, so loot for one. Then whenever you discard one or more non-land cards, you may exile one of them from your graveyard. If you do, you may cast it this turn. I love a little bear with trickiness to it. And this card has a lot of little trickiness to it. I wish you didn't have to pay the one, but I also understand. <laughs> yeah, just uh, kind of drawing a card for free at that point if you didn't. Yeah. Which, I mean, yeah, so be it. For drawing a card for free. I mean, is that the worst? Is that the worst? Worst thing that can happen? So drawing a card for yeah, free. This is why I mentioned that red regularly disappoints. Uh, if you've been playing the red cards for a while, you know that you don't always get upside on the grizzly bears. You, you take them as they print them. It's true. Uh, the thing that I most like about this card is the first two abilities are not... The, the first ability and the second ability are not linked. It just says whenever you discard one or more non-land cards, you may exile one of them mm -hmm. from your graveyard. If you do, you can cast this turn. So you could Faithless Looting and be able to cast one of those back. It doesn't matter whether you discarded it with Conspiracy Theorist itself just as long as it was discarded from your hand. Mm -hmm. And that is the most attractive part of this card to me. Yeah, it's super awesome. I mean, take also, for example, you're attacking with Conspiracy Theorists and Loot Real Core. Yeah. You get that loot, you get to cast this card, don't even pay the one. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like that's going to be a when it's convenient. If it's not going to, if it's not going to disrupt your... Uh, your your curve this card reminds me of oh my gosh the it's the card from Kaldheim limited it's a three two for three and has an ability for boast of one and you exile the top card of your deck and you can cast it this turn okay i've played with this card i don't remember the name i think it's like tusk i literally i'm, I'm just blanking on it Someone that is listening is like obviously it's this blah 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 name i can't believe justin's so dumb he doesn't remember it uh, anyway, it reminds me of that card. <laughs> and that card was often very tricky. Tuscari Firewalker was the name of the card. Because you don't always want to do the ability. And I think a lot of times with this time, you won't do the ability unless you are in the neighborhood of being able to cast something, because otherwise... You're having to spend that one, which is generally pretty important uh, on the you know third turn of the game or fourth turn of the game. Mm -hmm. If you're playing two mana two twos, you probably care about one mana quite a bit. Yeah, exactly. This card's also okay. just a human, which is awesome. I, mm -hmm. I I anticipate cubing with this card quite a bit. Yes, definitely. Yeah, I I, I like this one. This is this is my favorite red card among all of the ones available in this set. But there's another card you are high on. Yeah, I, was, <laughs> I have read this card several times just to make sure that what I read was true and this card is real. It's not, like, incredible or anything, but there's going to be games where you lose to this card and you're just kind of like, what, what even just happened to me? But this is a card that is crackling with power. It's called Crackle with Power. It's a yes. sorcery. 
cost red red x x x so you know when you see a variable multiple times you got to pay three mana into that x so for five mana x equals one eight mana x equals two you get it it's a sorcery crackle with power deals five times x to each of up to x targets all right so spent some time poo-pooing on rip apart last week mm -hmm. because it can only hit creatures and planeswalkers this card is Lava Axe that's also Plague Wind for creatures with less than six toughness. I guess uh, you have to pay the extra mana for it, you know, but um, yeah, if you get up to eight and you just deal ten to two things, which is going to happen, like if you're a mid-range deck, that's half your opponent's life total. I don't well, know. It's not ha I mean, you can't target your opponent with both. You can target them with one. Yeah, but the, the one, else. if you get up to eight, it's five times X, so it's five times two. Sure. So you hit them yeah, for, for eight, ten. For, for eight mana? That's, that's what you... That's what you well, that's it's, what you're... it's also just five mana, five damage for five. All right. Yeah. I'm going yeah, I'm I'm to be honest with, with you. I'm going to be honest with you. This was the read that actually got me to what the card actually does. <laughs> okay. So I'm colder on the card than I was before. <laughs> before you before you read all the words? I read all the words. I didn't really absorb all the words. I mean, look, I'm all for yeah, you can you can really get them. Look, hey, Ryan, if you put 11 man into this, you're going to deal them 15. Yeah, that's a lot. That is a lot. If you put uh if you put 14 man into this, they're okay. just dead. Okay. Um, I'm going to request the editor to edit, edit Crackle with Power out of this podcast. <laughs> I missed this one. <laughs> card is not uh, actually Crackling with Power. It is not. It is, it is a lot. You know, I wasn't, expecting a, uh, I wasn't expecting a Dark Phoenix reference in the Strixhaven set, but here we are for that. <laughs> um, it's, of all, it's, it's shocking to me. Of all of the, like, different overtly referential things to Harry Potter and all the other stuff with Wizard School. The one that was the clearest to me is is this card. It's like, oh yeah, this is this is this is clearly just Dark Phoenix. Ironically, there's also three X's in it. I don't know. It's a lot of a lot of interesting stuff going on with uh, referentially. <laughs> and the least interesting part is the text box. Yeah. But, yeah, this card is not very exciting, is it? <laughs> no, it's i mean no no actually it's quite exciting it's very good in the arena very... cube still i think um potentially yeah i'm a big i, I will say this i'm a huge fan of bane fire in the arena cube yeah I play like a big big fan of bane fire bane fire cube. devil's play yeah yeah yep yeah so i'm a big fan of that so you're probably right i would give it that I mean, I do think that we've talked, so we've brought the card up, so I do think that there are spots for this, but I think the cubes need to be slower. I think it is cool. This is cool. This card is going to make cool moments every time you cast it, because it's going to be a moment. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can cast it for eight, you're going to win. And if you cast it for five, it's just an expensive removal spell or a lava axe, which is not terrible. But once you start affecting with, like, cost reducers, then it starts to get more interesting. And if you can reduce the cost on this card and you're not necessarily paying wholesale, then I don't know. Maybe we have a uh, maybe we have a, a card in some lower powered cubes that can move the needle. We can slide this into custom. There's that green enchantment. You would know the card. You're, you're a big commander guy. Let's you copy mm -hmm. instants and sorceries that have X's when you cast them. Uh, yes. I literally am blanking on the name of the card. It's pretty, but, it's pretty new, but... Uh, yeah, it's, it was in um, the last Commander set. I'm just blanking on the name. Commander Legends? But you did whatever the card, Masters. I don't remember. I don't know anything about anyway, Commander, but I know but yes. this card's probably good in that format. Oh, yeah, this card's going to be great in that format. No, no doubt about that. Where eight mana is no big deal. Stands the reason you put it in your Commander cube, then. There you go. Boom. We've worked our way to the appropriate setup. <laughs> okay, do you want to re do you want to redeem yourself with another another uh, another card? I, I already lost everybody, but uh, we'll we'll see what we can do. <laughs> All right, so we we are we, 
That was our first custom power level <laughs> card in red. It sure was. Uh, and so the second one, let's talk about uh, Storm Kiln Artist. Oh, I love this card. We, talk, we mentioned this one briefly. You alluded to this card yeah. last week. This is our four mana, two, two dwarf shaman, three and a red. Storm Kiln Artist gets plus one, plus oh for each artifact you control. Magecraft, whenever you cast or copy an instant or sorcery, create a treasure token. This card is making the problem where I read Magecraft as Metalcraft more pronounced. Uh, yep. When I never get that sorted out, this card is the reason why. But it's going to be really nice in your common and uncommon cube, especially if you had a lot of use for artifacts lying around for extra mana. Those kind of environments also tend to involve a lot of spells with flashback or just value having extra cards, drawing extra cards. So getting those treasure tokens, it's not explicitly like a storm card. Uh, it's a little bit too much mana for that kind of thing, but it can lend itself to making pretty big turns. Yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of this card. I agree with everything you said. Uh, I wish this card, f selfishly for cube reasons, was a slightly less expensive, but I actually think it's still, I just think it's still pretty sweet, even at, even at the cost that it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's, it's very certainly, cool. yeah. I would, I, it's probably greedy because I think this card is just ex perfectly reasonable at four mana, because it is actually doing, it is it is doing a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm a big fan of that one. Uh, I'm gonna go with uh, Tome Shredder. And I think this is a great, I actually think this is a really great card for, for Pauper and Peasant Cubes. And maybe if you're doing like more of a Spells Matters theme in a lower powered cube environment. Anyway, Tome Shredder, two and a red. It's a 2-2 two, two wolf with haste. And you can tap it, exile an instant or sorcery card from your graveyard, put a plus one, plus one counter on Tome Shredder. Uh, this is kind of similar to me as the uh, the Orik Lore Mage, just a more aggressive version and kind of backwards. So maybe not at all like that card. <laughs> now that I say that out loud, I like that uh, this has haste. So it's it's kind of working with two angles on haste. You obviously can attack, but if you can't get by, then at the end of your opponent's turn on the first turn you cast this, you can make this a three. -three. And essentially, you keep eating stuff out of your graveyard until this is a relevant threat. And the fact that it doesn't say you can only do this as a sorcery means that I like this card instead of hating it. Which, if it said that as a sorcery, I would think this card is trash and would not have brought it up. <laughs> but it doesn't, so I think it's actually pretty sweet. Yeah, being able to hang out and, like, if the game involves any amount of blocking, activating on your opponent turn, so you're not just giving up what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I like I like this card. I think it's a I think it's a pretty neat threat for uh, the instants and sorcery decks in a different way than we've kind of seen before. Yeah, uh, the, the the abilities that give you lasting counters they, they play a bit differently than prowess. So there's mm -hmm. some interesting stuff going on there for sure. Yeah, definitely. All right, what else we got? All right, we have dragons approach. Two and a red is a sorcery. Dragon's Approach deals three damage to each opponent. You may exile Dragon's Approach and four cards. Nay, Dragon's Approach from your graveyard. If you do, search your library for a dragon creature card, put it on the battlefield, then shuffle. A deck can have any number of cards named Dragon's Approach. I just kind of picked the cards off the list. This looks like... Did you add this because we're talking about the breaking the sure multiple did. rule here? Yeah, sure did. Sure did. All right, I'm into it. Yeah, I think I think if you know for that type cube, uh, if you can ever if you can ever trigger that and just go nab a dragon, I think that's pretty sweet. And this card's not it's you know it's like a pretty mediocre lava spike, but uh, you don't have to cast them all. You just got to exile you just got to exile this and four other ones. Mm -hmm. So you just got to cast one. Yeah. So in a in a the singleton the breaking of the singleton rule, I think this is a, this is an interesting card to. To look at. Yeah, if you have a reliable way to fill your graveyard there and just getting to cast one, that'd be pretty awesome. Mm hmm Yep, for sure. Okay, so uh, the next card that we have is Ifrit Flame Painter. And I mainly wanted to bring this card up because it reminds me of a, another card. Uh, I'm blanking on the name, but I'll, maybe I'll remember it by the time I read it out. Ifrit Flame Painter, three and a red. It's a 1-4 Afrit Shaman with Double Strike. When Afrit Flame Painter deals combat damage to a player, you may cast target instant sorcery 
from your graveyard without paying its mana cost if it would be uh, if that soul would go into your graveyard exile instead. Notably, it doesn't matter how much damage you deal. So you can just deal the one damage, you can cast any size instant or sorcery. I think this is a cool one for, again, lower powered cubes that are working with uh, kind of large spell type stuff. And also potentially like multiplayer cubes. Because then you're going to have a much greater chance to be able to find someone that is either able to be hit or willing to be hit. <laughs> True. The so politic. Exactly. Uh, and I think that any, any time that you have a card that says you can cast instant or sorcery and it doesn't have any qualifier for mana cost on it, I always think that's worth a look. I think in higher powered cubes, the rate's just not there. It's a one, four for four, uh, regardless of what the rest of the ability is. But I think, out, I think outside of that, if you care about any large sized instants and sorceries, I think this is a, uh, could definitely be a, a fun card with some legs, uh, because it also has double strike. Yeah, it's also so. kind of cool if you're into the heroic or feather kind of thing. Like, casting yeah. slip through space on this card is pretty cool, too. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's actually very cool with slip, slip through space. Or, uh, oh, what is the one from Innistrad that has flashback for a blue? Oh, yeah, yeah. I Oh my! I, <laughs> I know the card, but it's it's the little thing diving into the like the uh, into the like into the street, the manhole. Uh-huh. great. That's as far. Well, we as can't we're remember the get. name of that card. <laughs> I can't remember the name of that card either. Um, so the card that this is this is like reminding me of. I'm going to see if I can find it real quick. It's from Journey into Nyx. Yeah, three mana, one three. Yes. I think it has double strike and trample. It, it does. It does. That was another card I'm that sure. like was kind of exciting when it was previewed and then turned out to be a bit of a dud. Uh Prophetic Flame Speaker. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. It's a little bit different because Prophetic Flame Speaker let you cast the card. And it's just you, you exit the top card of your library and you could cast the card. Now that only that costs three, but this just lets you cast it for free. So I think this card is significantly better. That card was also a mythic rare, which offended me personally. <laughs> okay, the last one we have is uh oh yeah. Illustrious Historian. One in red, two one human shaman. Uh, you can pay five, exile illustrious historian from your graveyard, create a tapped 3-2 red and white spirit creature token. I think this card is absolutely 100% reasonable in, in common only cube. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think uh, five mana later in the game. Again, you don't have to do it at sorcery speed, which is my favorite thing to not have on a card. <laughs> Means this card, I think, is is pretty sweet. I would probably include this just about all the time i can't really envision a scenario where this is where this is bad in a common zone cube yeah good and beat down decks and also if you just discard it you get some value mm -hmm. left over so a few different ways to play with it yeah you make a three two which is a solid size token okay anything else for red uh, i think we're through red there's a couple things we'll cycle back through but uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. those are the ones that jump off the page anyway. All right. Uh, on to green. All right. What do we have for uh, classic for green? Uh, we got uh, Big Donut. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, I agree. I wish, I wish I felt stronger about a card, but I simply do not. We'll start off with a custom card that I think kind of falls in bounds if this this is just in a good cards cube it, it'll compete sometimes but i'll, I'll explain why I, I don't think it generally is going to show up there but okay. uh first we'll sing the praises of dragon's guard elite we talked about this card last week one in a green two two human druid magecraft when you cast or copy an instant or sorcery spell put a plus one plus one counter on dragon's guard elite and then four green green double the number of plus one plus one counters 
doesn't take a lot to get this card going. It hits hard. Keeping those counters is a big deal as compared to some of the other mage craft we talked about earlier. That was kind of a short-term boost. So as long as you are casting your removal spell, your cantrip, this thing will hit harder that turn and on future turns as well. A lot to like about this card. The reason mm-hmm. it doesn't quite fit in the good cards cube is green's thing in classic cube power level tends to be cheap mana ramp. And if you're just trying to play cheap stuff that accelerates mana and expensive stuff, Magecraft is really not part of your game plan. Yeah. Like we were talking about earlier, green and white tend to have the lowest uh, percentage of spells just ac- across cubes in general. So card's great, but it hurts It hurts that just because of the, the surrounding cards and the rest of green are not going to benefit as much as you would like. Mm-hmm. The more your cube is just about efficient stuff, the more your cube is about combat. If you're into the grow theme, which we talked about, we're both pretty into the grow theme, this card is going to yeah. be a really powerful and cool effect too. Yeah, it's going to be very powerful. Very, very powerful. Yeah, this card was, this card is a like a, a, a combat dominating card at two mana if you're into the com, if, if, if you're looking at like a combat oriented cube. Mm-hmm. Okay. Moving on to, uh, I'm going to do a card for uh, another another thing that you really want uh, more instants and sorceries with, and this is, I think, if you have that, a pretty pretty powerful card. This is Mage Duel. Uh, I'm going to call this the Green of One Mind. Okay. Because you're not drawing cards, but you're you're doing card advantage in the green way. So it's two and a green, sorcery. This spell costs two less to cast if you cast another instant or sorcery spell this turn. Uh, target creature you control gets plus one, plus two until end of turn, and then fights target creature you don't control. Plus one, plus two on a fight card that cost, potentially costs one is massive. Uh, if you have a cube where you have cards like Prey Upon or like Savage Stomp in your cube, uh, I think... I think this card is very, very good. Having this cost one to to have like a legitimate green removal spell in the way that green does, um, I think is this is probably pretty high on my list of of the green fight and bite cards that I would be interested in including in a lower in a lower power or lower rarity cube. I'm pretty cold on fight effects and in general trying to play green removal spells if your environment is really about that sort of thing though like your popper your kind of spells matter and yeah this this is enough buff where you can fight and also be buffed enough Mm -hmm. to make a good attack that turn with the creature so there's something to like there it's a category of card that for me at least is fighting uphill okay that's fair and i think for you know when I'm looking, when I'm when I'm considering uh, lower rarity cubes, there's never a lot of these cards, but I always feel like the ones that are included are pretty important. Um, something like a like a ram through, and uh, prey upon is always the very cheap one that generally makes it in. And I, I I actually I do think that this is I do think this is one of the I do think this is one of the better ones because giving plus one plus one or plus one plus two rather. Uh, makes a, a very, very notable difference. But I get what you're saying. I mean, fighting is like, it's the least efficient way to remove a creature possible in magic, generally. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you're still in green. Have but to have a creature around. This one... A lot of qualifiers. It's not great for three, so you're like trying to cast another spell too. But uh, mm-hmm. I, I can see it, it working pretty well at, at the best case. Yeah, sure. I got it. Put that down on my card, Ryan hates this. <laughs> Gonna have to start a new paper. Yeah, okay, it's, it's uh, a long what, list. What else do we have? Talk about a card I like. This card's very charming. I, I love Honor Troll. Yeah, I love this card too. Nice little pun. We have two and a green, a two, three troll druid with vigilance. If you would gain life, you gain that much life, plus one instead. And it gets plus two, plus one as long as you have 25 or more life. So life gain is, uh, how to put this, uh, dog shit. It's a very bad thing to try to do. (laughs) But periodically, they've been putting in more cards that kind of care about life, that do something Mm -hmm. that's worth doing, that incidentally gains life. 
we've seen this as a theme that's been more heavily enforced or in other builds lighter in the various arena cubes and there's some ways to do it where your life gain stuff actually cares about damaging your opponent like yeah. this card being a three mana four four with vigilance if you get up to that threshold that that moves the needle for me you know maybe it's just like a peasant thing or maybe it's a low power cube with yeah. any rarity with some life gain theme but this is a lot more fun to play with than soul warden and it's quite a bit better yeah i really i i like this because i like the aggressively slanted life gainy cards and this one this one is it packs a wallop yeah when the life gain for, for cards mana. actually provoke a damage race correct that's when we're talking about something that is competitive fun and interesting yeah and with the life gain cards you really just need a critical mass of stuff and if you're if you're slanting your life gain stuff into green and white which i think is a very realistic angle it's always white and generally it's like black or green and you're getting a lot of green actually you're ironically the life gain cards in this set are in black and green and not white mm -hmm. but that's a either way uh so that's a that's a different angle that you could take this and this is this is an excellent payoff because it's a, a a four four a four four for three with vigilance is just a monster just reminded of kind of fun story so i'm going to sneak this in at the hour of devastation pre-release i played against two opponents that cast the card oketra's last mercy you know you remember this one yes you make your life total your starting life total your starting life total and you yeah, don't and you skip your next untap yeah so it gains like you know up to 19 life or whatever yeah. I had two opponents play that against me, and it's just like, oh, yeah. okay, well, I'm just going to beat you a turn or two later. You know, as long as creatures are still able to attack with impunity, if I'm not literally registering lava spikes, extra damage, I can deal. A card like this, though, that's punching you back, <laughs> the life gain matters a lot more if it's attached to a fist. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I feel like you're always like... What is the best, like, life gain payoff card? Like, Archangel of Thune? Uh, Archangel of Thune, or, like, Sarah Ascendant is in contention. Sarah Ascendant's good, yeah. 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 And I think you, if, if you're, like, the closer you're pro approaching those power levels, then the more reasonable the cards become, and then you can kind of build downward. Say, well, these are reasonable cards on their own. They care about life gain, but they're also not terrible. And then you can kind of say, well, what else can, can fit in this kind of direction or theme that i'm building mm -hmm. and cards like honor troll and even like a johnny's pride mate which is obviously the very the very common one but something that turns into a threat based on your life gain shenanigans mm -hmm. are always the angle you want to look at yep okay i am going to well, i'll have another card that gains life but kind of in a different way and the only reason i bring this up is because this is a very comparable card which can sometimes be overwhelming. And I'm talking about Bookworm. This is a 7-7 seven, seven for 7 and a green Worm with Trample. When it enters the battlefield, you gain 3 life and draw a card. Now, a lot of you that are listening know the card I am referencing, uh, especially for like uh, common on common cubes, is Palaka Worm. Palaka Worm has the tendency to beat you over the head. Yes. Because seven seven life is a just an outraged amount of life. This costs one more mana. It also has the really neat little ability, two and a green, put bookworm from your graveyard into your library, third from the top. And I think I like this more than Palaka Worm because it's giving you the card draw instantly. It's giving you three life. Obviously, that's worse than seven, but... Oftentimes, I have seen Palaka Worm hit the battlefield, and then the uh, the aggressive deck has no way to make up that damage. Mm -hmm. And I think three is a lot easier to stomach with a card that is equally powerful in a different way. Yeah, the, the cards doing different things in different matchups, right? Where against the aggressive decks, seven life's a big deal. But mm -hmm. then drawing one card against an opponent that has a lot of card advantage and more controlling deck is less of a thing. Yep. But a threat that can just keep coming back, that, that's very scary against that style of deck. 
Exactly. Yeah. yeah, if you can just like, oh, pull awkward. Well, you gain seven. I'll just heartless act this. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to go about my day. It's going to take me another turn to kill you. But with, but with Bookworm, I feel like it's helping both of the sides. Because it's not as oppressive against the aggressive decks, and it makes it a little scarier recursive threat against the controlling decks. So I would be in favor of like making that change rather than like adding it. Um, but I've been on the I've been on the losing side of Palaka Worm many times, and I'm trying to beat my beat my opponent down, and then it comes down, and it's a bridge too far. Yeah, I, I have been Palaka Wormed. I've also done my fair share of Palaka Worming. I think mm -hmm. when Rise of the Eldrazi was in print, I was drafting that set like three times a week. So yeah. I've cast me some worms, but uh, I'm I'm willing to explore the Bookworm instead. Okay, it certainly doesn't have the. Uh... You know, there's there's no nostalgic resonance with Bookworm versus Palaka Worm, but I'm hope I'm hoping people can maybe see the light. <laughs> it, it starts with playing it once. Yeah, nostalgia is built over time. That's true. All right, uh, what do you got next? Hey, it's, a, it's another life gain related card. Uh, oh. Accomplished alchemist. So for three and a green, we have an elf druid. It's a two five. It can tap to add one man of any color or it can tap to add X mana of any one color, where X is the amount of life you gain this turn. This is the kind of card that makes exploring life gain quite a bit more interesting. Yeah. And, you know, you're not going to be into this sort of thing if you can just cast draw X cards, or like if this is in the same cube as stuff like Concentrate and Harmonize or whatever. But if you're playing like a life gain deck that has a lot of moving parts and some of them have activated abilities... There's a few different life gain cards, like white enchantments that uh, trigger in some way when you gain life to draw extra cards for some amount of mana, and then have some other ability tacked on. Or even if it's something as simple as Soul Warden plus Mobilization, where yeah. this mana can really yeah. snowball in a meaningful way. There's some pretty cool stuff you can do with a card like this. Yeah, I actually am a big fan of this card. Uh, it, life so it's it's really interesting because it's like you're almost trading a resource, but you're not because you're getting both. But life, gaining life is very easy to come by, but gaining a lot of mana at one time is not very easy to come by. Mm -hmm. So when you when you look at that angle and you say, well, this is an opportunity for me to gain a lot of mana at one time, that's probably worth exploring. Now, it's difficult in a cube-based environment because you have to have a lot of things go right from a draft perspective to have this line up. But there is a there is a payoff if you can do that, because if you're making even even if it's something as some small as like three mana a turn, you're still casting Black Lotus every turn, mm -hmm. and that's that's something that you have to pay attention to. Uh, this would be one you'd have to go out of your way to really make sure, especially in green, because you're talking about a mana creature that starts at four mana. You really got to make sure that you're doing something meaningful before and after that, which makes it a really tough add. But I think the card's cool as well, and I would want I I want to I I would like to play a cube where this is a where this is a very good card. I think that would be a lot of fun. Mm, definitely combines with well wisher. Yeah, the aforementioned well wisher. That's true. <laughs> okay, so uh, I have. I have one more that I want to list, and this is also for uh, lower rarity cubes. I just think this is a a pretty a pretty powerful card uh, in some settings. This is Bayou Groff, one in a green. It's a five four plant dog, but it says an additional cost to cast this spell. Sacrifice a creature, pay three. Uh, usually, the sacrificing creature stuff is more in like black and red, but and again, this is for lower powered cubes. But if you're you're wanting to kind of slant that into green. I think this is a great add because a 5-4 is massive. Blister pod. And yeah. Tukatum yeah, that, there's, salad. Yeah. Uh, catacomb sifter. You know, there's a bunch of different little stuff that you can benefit from. Usually it's 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 like kind of slanting into into black as well because the 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 green well runs kind of dry but if you're doing that and you have some some things it says when it dies it does a thing uh this card's pretty great because you can you can obviously trigger those and then you get a huge creature out of it for two mana 
Young Wolf. Young Wolf's a good one. That's a great one. Yeah, a lot yeah. of stuff you can do with that. Yeah, a bunch of stuff. This is a pretty good payoff for that. Just a, just attacking and blocking, but, you know, this is going to be bigger than most other things at the cost. Yeah, certainly in, like, a common and uncommon cube. Mm-hmm. All right, what else for green? All right, I got one more. This one... Oh, uh, baby. If, if this card's for you, you already know it, but uh, we'll, we'll talk <laughs> over it anyway. We have Verdant Mastery. For five and a green, this is another one of the cycle that has a reduced cost as well. So it's a sorcery. You can pay three and a green instead. Search your library for up to four basic land cards. Reveal them. Put one of them onto the battlefield tapped under an opponent's control if you pay the cheaper cost. Put two of them onto the battlefield tapped under your control and the rest into your hand. So if you pay the full six, you get two tapped lands, two into your hand. If you get it cheaper, you give someone else a land. There's a six mana sorcery that searches for three basics and puts them in the battlefield tapped. It's Nissa something. This is renewal, and you gain seven life. Yeah, so this, this card's not quite that, but there's a cheaper option if you're into if you're in a multiplayer game, giving somebody else a land. It can either be a political move if you're trying to team up against somebody else, or you give the land to the person that's missed their third land drop, and then you're the hero of the table. You know, a lot, a lot you can do with that. But <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty nice card. Yeah. It, it's going to show up there, and it's not totally out of the question that this shows up in two player environments either. Yeah, and still, I mean, you're, it, it gets you three resources, ultimately, because you're getting two, oh wait, you, yeah, yes, you're getting, you're getting two, and then one to your hand, and then one to your opponent. My only issue with this card, and honestly, this is really my biggest issue, is I don't think I'll ever cast this for six. <laughs> I think I would just look at six man and be like, oh, that's just so much. And if I got six mana, I don't probably need to cast it. But it's still going to draw you four cards. I uh, put two of them into play. I lost a, a game this week because I kicked a Skyclave Relic instead of playing it for three. So mm. we, we fall on opposite sides of that. I'm, I'm, I'm You're willing trying to, get to lose max to value. spend too much mana. <laughs> yeah, it's fair. Okay, all right. I mean, look, I think that's very no, you know, notable to see what kind of people we are, <laughs> how we <laughs> interpret this card. I'm looking, I'm just like, God, six mana. Oh, man. Okay, uh, anything else from green? Uh, I think that's uh, where we're at with green. Um, not, not, not a great green set, but we'll get to more in multicolor. There's some stuff that's yeah. actually kind of interesting to talk about next week when we get to dual face cards as well. Definitely, definitely. Okay, so everything else that's not multicolor, so colorless and land. I don't think we have anything, which is not surprising because this is this is not a colorless and land focus set. There's nothing that's really going to make it into all cubes. So nothing that's going to hit the classic requirement mm. but i do think there's a few other interesting cards uh that could go in custom we talked about the snarls last week bring that up again uh mainly just to say the word snarls you have the full cycle of 10 now don't forget that if you're looking for uh a a more cost effective way to have a cycle of 10 in your cube these will be uh monetarily inexpensive also, something to be said for that. Some pretty nice arts in this batch. Yes, 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 yes. And the names are obviously much better. Yeah. If you do run the full 10 snarl cycle, strongly recommend crossing off one word in the allied color ones and replacing it with snarl. Yeah. I don't yeah, care if do it's that. Port Snarl or Snarl Town. <laughs> well, I kind of like Snarl Town. Yeah, I do like Snarl Town. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah i'm definitely for that i'm definitely for that okay uh all right what 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 are, what are we looking at for 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 custom so this, for everything else this set has probably the card that i've been most excited about that i don't know i'll ever play like maybe yeah. ever strixhaven stadium this is a three mana artifact that makes me wish I was a commander player. It taps for a colorless mana, and you put a point counter on Strixhaven Stadium. Whenever a creature deals combat damage to you, you remove a point counter from Strixhaven Stadium. 
And then whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to an opponent, you put a point counter on it. Then, if it has 10 or more point counters, you remove all of them, and that player loses the game. So you enter this mini-game, where it's yeah. just like, I'm only attacking you for one, but don't let me do this 10 times. <laughs> yeah. I love this card. I think the design of this card is S tier. Uh, it's I. It's one of the first true actual factual mini game cards, like that continues, like not in just an instant, but like over multiple turns. Yes, oh, it's just awesome. It's just so awesome. The design's incredible. I I like the idea of a custom Magic format. Maybe it's two player, maybe it's multiplayer, but. Just every player starts with this card in play, and it can't be disenchanted. Oh man, you could you could make it. Yeah, I mean, I <laughs> I might. Yeah, if, yeah. If we're at a point where I can actually uh, hang out with human beings in person, this is something I intend to pitch. What if? Well, let's develop this a little further. So, you what if you made like five decks? Each of the two color combination. Ooh. Yeah. I like where your head's at on this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then everyone just got one of the decks. And then you're you you play kind of a commander style multiplayer, but the only way to win Yeah, with, is, with the stadium. Is with the stadium. That's what you gotta do. I love it. I think it's probably yeah. true that the stadium is a big enough win condition that you don't need to make, especially if you're like making the decks. Oh, it's just true. Yeah. <laughs> you're going to want to do that anyway. Yeah, it's all going to be just like cheap, evasive creatures or whatever. So, yeah. Yeah, it's fair. That's fair. Yeah. But I think, I think having, having it to where you have, have the decks already made. So, so no one's uh, w trying to like specifically like super cheese anybody else. Because I think if you're really trying to do that, it would be too easy to do. Right. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. Oh, man. Talk about lands. Uh, the campuses, I think, are the best common come to play tap lands ever. Are we uh, excluding bounce lands here? Um... No, bounce lands are better. I was gonna say I'm. I was gonna say I would rather play. I've had my bounce lands in higher power cube environments destroyed way too many times. So oh, I'm like, yeah, keep keep them away from the wastelands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, no, 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 no. Bounce lands are better in 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 pauper and peasant environments. But I think these these will be second. I'll say these are second. I'll amend that. Okay. Uh, paying four to scry one is awesome. The only downside to this is there's only five of them. You don't get one for every single color pair. I'm yeah, sure we will eventually, but we don't. There's also just like multiple ally pairs that this like. I don't really care about Boros Campus. I do care about Demir and Azorius Campus. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think they're really sweet. I think they're great. I think they're quite powerful. Yeah, they are nice lands. Okay, what else we got? We have the Biblioplex. Mm. It's a cool card. It's a land. Taps for a colorless mana. You can pay two and tap it. Look at the top card of your library. If it's an instant or a sorcery card, you may reveal it and put it into your hand. And if you don't put it in your hand, so if it's not an instant or a sorcery, you may put it in your graveyard. Activate only if you have exactly zero or seven cards in hand. I guess you can also put it in your graveyard if it's an instant or a sorcery, if that makes sense to do. So, anyway. This is the kind of card where there's, there's a lot going on to get paid off, but the opportunity cost of playing it is very low, especially if your cube has very good mana or... The, the cube I actually thought of when I was reading this card is many years ago I played a mono blue cube, and okay. that's a spot where pretty easy to play a couple of colorless lands if you're only playing islands otherwise, and a lot of your cards are instants and sorceries, so... A land that has the potential to put extra cards in your hand is very powerful in that kind of setting. And if nothing else, this card is just incredibly cool. Have you ever played a cube that's just instants and sorceries? I have not. Me neither. But I would this make the this card makes me want that cube to exist. Yeah, I would I would play this there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, 
I think this card is it's really the opportunity cost, which is like non-existent. Mm-hmm. It's it's the draft pick is the cost. Like wherever you pick that, that is the highest cost that you are inducing to to have this card. Right. Because uh, there's no deck building cost. You're going to be able to slot it in. And I think it's mostly going to be not good. Uh, but if you're picking it like 10th pick, then it doesn't even matter. So, yeah. I like it. I like it. I don't love it. I think it's going to, it's going to, I think it's going to matter a pretty low amount because there's not many times that you have two mana, a lot of instants and sorceries, and then zero or seven cards in your hand. Right. It's ultimately more cool than good. Yeah. But it is very cool. Yes, it is. For sure. Okay. Um, is that all? Is that all we have? We do have a colorless card oh, that's yes. kind of funky. Yes. It's a little dual face card. We have Wandering Archaic on the front side and the back side, Explore the Vast Lands. So Wandering Archaic is a 5-mana 4-4 four, four Avatar. Whenever an opponent casts an instant or sorcery spell, they may pay 2. If they don't, did you pay the 2? If you don't, you may copy that spell. You may choose new targets for the copy. So that's going to give you some value in a lot of environments. On the back side, mm-hmm. a 3-mana sorcery, 3 generic mana. So you can just cast this with whatever. Each player looks at the top 5 cards of their library, reveals a land and or an instant or sorcery card from among them puts the cards revealed this way into their hand and the rest on the bottom of their library in a random order. Each player gains three life. So there's kind of some pretty interesting stuff going on with this card because it's not doing anything inherently powerful in your deck, but it offers two modes that are going to allow you to play in a way that matches what your opponent's up to. So if your opponent's playing a bunch of like removal spells or cards that draw extra cards, you play a Wandering Archaic, even if they kill it right away, there's a good chance you'll be able to copy their spell and kill something of theirs, or at least mm-hmm. tax all their mana. And if they're aggressive, Explore the Vast Lands is actually pretty nice because you're more likely to be interested in continuing to make your land drops. You might find a removal spell with it. And then each player gains three life is almost a one-sided effect because you care about yeah. the three life and they probably don't. Exactly. And on the front side, like, I mean, it's a solid body. Like a four 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 five is is pretty reasonable. Yeah. You know, it's like to me, it it feels like it's a four 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 five with a random enter the battlefield ability that you're not going to get to determine. <laughs> yeah. But will be the but will be the equivalent of another card in the cube. So. Yeah, I I actually I actually kind of like this card. I think it's really interesting. It's not like crazy powerful, but uh, it it is a very a, a card that very much encourages decision making, uh, important decision making. Yes, and it's not like the kind of thing you can build around because these effects no. are pretty contextual on what your opponent is up to. But it's the kind of card that's pretty fun to play with anyway. Yeah, I, and I like it because generally I don't like cards that are like very contextual on your opponent is doing browbeat type cards for cube, but for this you have to put very little effort into it and the payoff could be very high. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I'm, in, I'm, I'm in for this one. I think I would, I would like, uh, this is a card that I would like to, I like to play with to kind of get a feel for, um, but I'm interested in doing that at least. Definitely. All right. I think that is everything. That's not a multicolored card, which we're going to come back to next week. Now, uh, we do have one last thing uh, because there's a whole class of cards that we've not talked about. So we're going to take one last break and then when we come back, we're going to talk about learning and lessening. We'll be back in just a second. Listen up, gamers. Taking a break from the pod to let you know how you can qualify for the Strixhaven Championship. That's right, the SEG Tour Online is back and we're giving away cash prizes. Tens of thousands of MTG Arena gems, MTG Arena Weekend Qualifier Invitations, and Strixhaven Championship Invitations. Go to SEGTourOnline.StarCityGames.com for event information. The road to the Strixhaven Championship begins here with the SEG Tour Online. All right, Ryan. You gonna learn you something? Maybe you're going to learn me something. Well, I like to think that we're both learning over time. You know, we're, we're, we're co-hosts. 
co-teachers in this case. Yeah, co-teachers and or co-students. co-students. Yeah. There you go. All right. So learn and lesson. It's quite interesting. So for the baseline, we have 21 cards that have the text learn. And learn says, you may reveal a lesson card you own from outside the game and put it into your hand or discard a card and draw a card. There's 21 of those cards. And then there's 20 cards that have the subtype lesson, all of which are sorceries. And they are a smorgasbord of effects. Now, there's 21 learn cards and only 20 lesson cards, which means if you were to cast all of the learn cards on the last learn card, uh, you would simply learn that you had learned every lesson possible and you would not be able to get a lesson. The final lesson is that you have nothing more to learn. There you go. Boom. How flavorful. I wonder if they drew it up like that. If they didn't, I don't want them to take credit. I want them to credit the 540 podcast. Yes. I also don't want to know the answer. Like the well, real good, answer. Good news. <laughs> we will absolutely never know the answer. All right. So tell me what you think about learn. So the fact that learn has this modality is definitely a big deal for the mechanic. Both just make it function and limited and just yes. for how the card would theoretically play if you wanted to put it into your own kind of environment or I guess play it in constructed, but you get to either loot or you get to reach to your sideboard for a lesson and put it in your hand. So I guess you rummage, you don't loot, but anyway. To be better than rummaging, it doesn't take a lot. And I, from reading over the lessons, it's pretty clear that they balance them pretty carefully. Mm -hmm. But there's still interesting effects, like if it's just a card that's being attached to a card, then it doesn't have to be particularly good to be appealing. Yes. Now, this is balanced somewhat by the fact that a lot of the learn cards are just not very good. <laughs> so you get two halves that hopefully are worth a card, but there, there's definitely some of these that are worth looking at. I think the one that is most appealing is Professor of Symbology, which is one and a white for a 2-1. It enters the battlefield, you learn, which is some card selection in white, which is something you don't always get on a reasonable, splashable body. Or you can take a look at some of these lessons to uh, ramp it up a little bit. The tough question for a cube, if you just get past the general power level of all these cards, is how are you going to implement it? How are you going to get a player to have a card that learns and a lesson for it to learn? Yeah. And that's, from a bunch of different angles, that is the trick. Because... You need to have a critical mass, of really, of both of these. Right. And if you're talking about using a singleton rule, um, it's unless you're going, people are in your playgroup are going out of their way to target lesson and learn cards. These, just by the nature of the function of singleton, these are going to end up very low picks because on their own, almost regardless of the power level. Now, there's a, there's a few cards that I think are reasonable. But outside, outside of those select few, you, you need to link up the lesson and learn to make it, to make the juice worth the squeeze. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not that the combination of the two cards are not, because I actually think that, I think that the lesson cards are all fine given the context that you're getting them for free, that you're drawing them for free. But it's the cost, it's the drafting cost that I think is the more difficult thing to figure out. So a lot of uh, cube house rules have a way of being improperly balanced. Yeah, be careful with this sort of thing. I, I've tried. Here's an example of a house rule that I tried that worked really poorly in my popper cube. It partly was to try to get more good white cards. I put in squadron hawk, but if you drafted it, you got three squadron hawks. That's like... Pretty dang good. It, it, it uh, yeah. was powerful enough that it was not fun at all when you lost to it. So I, I cut that out. I have some house rules that I end up liking, which not really a huge reason to get into that, but I'm going to pitch an interesting house rule for learning lessons. All right. So you, you determine whichever cards with learn you want to put in your cube. And I think it would be very cool if you mocked up 
like a spell book trade binder. And whenever you cast your learn card, you got to open up the spell book and just cast whichever or grab whichever lesson you wanted from it. Okay. I mean, that seems pretty reasonable because like, what's the best, so what's the best thing that you could do? There's 20 lessons. Obviously, a lot of them are contextual, but mm -hmm. like, what is the, I'm trying to like figure out like, what's the best scenario you could do? Is it, um... I mean, like illuminate history, which is a four mana lets you discard any number of cards and, uh, you can make yeah. a three, two, if you have threshold and you draw however many cards you discarded, that card's like kind of always on mascot mm -hmm. exhibition, seven mana, you make a, a two, one, a three, two and a four, four, like that, that's a pretty good card just to get for playing on a card that could otherwise rummage. But like none of this stuff is oppressively powerful. No. And there's a couple of, I, I kind of like that. I kind of like that because I don't, I, I think that it's a tough sell. It's going to be, I mean, really, this is difficult for me to evaluate without playing Strixhaven Limited yet because obviously it doesn't, set's not out yet, but mm -hmm. um, I, I'm very curious to see like how frequently, how frequently these, these would come up without having this special open spell book that you could grab from uh, where you have to draft them also. Mm -hmm. And how low and given, once I have the context of that, then in turn, how low does the power level have to go for me to want to just straight up include these cards? And then maybe taking it one step further, then you do you just look at doing a Strixhaven focused aesthetic type cube. Yeah, and I think that you almost have to go to that level. Yeah. And then once you're there, I mean, my, my understanding is that Strixhaven boosters, the draft boosters, are all seated with one lesson. Either either that's true or I made it up. I don't know. You, you... <laughs> I'm, not a, I'm not 100. I, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, but anyway, that, that's a thing you can do to introduce lessons with a high degree of consistency to your environment now yeah good chance you're breaking the multiple rule to do that as well because you have a weird number you're working with there's there's 20 cards yeah i think you probably i'll really when you are exploring lesson and learn it seems like this is an is another more interesting facet on the breaking the multiple rule like we were talking about a couple of weeks ago or last week, whenever we talked about it, I don't really know. But you you would have a lot more opportunities in drafting to pass these cards without being worried that you will be passing them forever and you will never see a payoff. And the payoff in this sense are these lesson cards which are mediocre. So it feels if you don't if you don't have the opportunity to have them in multiples, it's going to feel really bad to have a learn card and then be like, I have to draft this lesson because this is the payoff that I require for this other card that I drafted to even function at all. But if you had, it doesn't even have to be like four of them. If you even have like two of each, or or two or three, and then you could be more selective which whatever lessons that you're getting. Uh, I think that is a lot easier to swallow knowing that the lesson cards are going to be later picks in draft, but I don't always think that's a bad thing to know that there's cards that are going to end up 10th through 15th in the pick order. Mm -hmm. in, in particular, like these are cards that rely on something else going on to show up, but if you have enough learning and lesson, it's, it's very different than, for example, a Kiki Jiki Pester Mite situation, you know? Like, those cards, there's enough drafts where they go late and nobody plays them. These are cards that'll go late and, like, will show up meaningfully. Yeah. Yeah, by the time you... Because you, you, you can be prepared for to pick up an elemental summoning, which is a five mana make a 4-4 four, four token late, or even, like, the environmental sciences, uh, two colorless... Search your library for a basic land reveal, put in your hand, gain two life. Cards that are cards that are playable when you cast them because they're providing a solid body or some sort of uh I was gonna say card advantage, but not card disadvantage. <laughs> um 
So, yeah, I don't know. I think this will be an interesting thing to hear from the listeners about and maybe to come back and at least touch on after we've had a chance to to draft just regular Strixhaven in real life. Yeah, definitely. All right. We're going to be back next week and we're going to be tackling all the rest of Strixhaven, which is going to be called, which is going to be for all of the multicolored cards, each of the five colleges, and then kind of our overall thoughts on the set. So we want to thank everybody that listened. Remember, you can subscribe to the 540 on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon, Stitcher, YouTube, your local podcast app, anything you're listening to. We always appreciate that. And of course, leave us a review whenever you are able to do so for the algorithm. It's not even for us. The algorithm is a hungry beast. To it, it needs for to the fed. algorithm. Yeah. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at jparnell1. You can find my other podcast, Think Twice MTG, by searching exactly that on any audio platform, including the one you're on now. Of course, I'm on Commander Versus on YouTube and Star City Games every week, and I stream at twitch.tv slash jparnell a couple of times a week, so you can check me out there. Ryan, what you got? You can find me on Twitter at Ryan Overdrive. You can find my articles on StarCityGames.com. We are recording on Sunday. We are still in the Nega Cube on Magic Online, which I wrote a breakdown Hello. for on StarCityGames.com. There will be another Spotlight Cube coming out this week. You'll know what it is by the time you hear me saying that I don't know what it is, but you'll know what it is, and you'll already have access to my breakdown of that cube when you're listening to this wow. article. And then uh, we'll be getting into some more cube theory stuff soon. Maybe some uh, written Strixhaven content as well. But any updates on that front, you can find on my Twitter at Ryan Overdrive. Beautiful. So they know more than you if they're listening to this. They know more about what I know at the time that they are hearing me say that. Perfect and very clear. Yes. Excellent. That's the 540 this week. We will be back again with the rest of Strixhaven. Hopefully we got some goodies in multicolor. We'll find out in a week. Catch you all next time. Mm -hmm.